section forty nine of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten continued thomas de quincey seventeen eighty five eighteen fifty nine in de quincey the romantic element is even more strongly developed than in lamb not only in his critical work but also in his erratic and imaginative life he was profoundly educated even more so than coleridge and was one of the keenest intellects of the age yet his wonderful intellect seems always subordinate to his passion for dreaming like lamb he was a friend and associate of the lake poets making his headquarters in wordsworth's old cottage at grasmere for nearly twenty years here the resemblance ceases and a marked contrast begins as a man lamb is the most human and lovable of all our essayists while de quincey is the most uncanny and incomprehensible lamb's modest works breathe the two essential qualities of sympathy and humor the greater number of de quincey's essays while possessing more or less of both of these qualities are characterized chiefly by their brilliant style life as seen through de quincey's eyes is nebulous and chaotic and there is a suspicion of the fabulous in all that he wrote even in the revolt of the tartars the romantic element is uppermost and in much of de quincey's prose the element of unreality is more noticeable than in shelley's poetry of his subject matter his facts ideas and criticisms we are generally suspicious but of his style sometimes stately and sometimes headlong now gorgeous as an oriental dream now musical as keats and dimion and always even in the most violent contrasts showing a harmony between the idea and the expression such as no other english writer with the possible exception of newman has ever rivalled say what you will of the marvelous brilliancy of de quincey's style you have still only half expressed the truth it is the style alone which makes these essays immortal life de quincey was born in manchester in seventeen eighty five in neither his father who was a prosperous merchant nor his mother who was a quiet unsympathetic woman do we see any suggestion of the son's almost uncanny genius as a child he was given to dreams more vivid and intense but less beautiful than those of the young blake to whom he bears a strong resemblance in the grammar school at bath he displayed astonishing ability and acquired greek and latin with a rapidity that frightened his slow tutors at fifteen he not only read greek but spoke it fluently and one of his astounded teachers remarked that boy could harangue an athenian mob better than you or i could address an english one from the grammar school at manchester whither he was sent in eighteen hundred he soon ran away finding the instruction far below his abilities and the rough life absolutely intolerable to his sensitive nature an uncle just home from india interceded for the boy lest he be sent back to the school which he hated and with an allowance of a guinea a week he started a career of vagrancy much like that of goldsmith living on the open hills in the huts of shepherds and charcoal burners in the tents of gypsies wherever fancy led him his fear of the manchester school finally led him to run away to london where without money or friends his life was even more extraordinary than his gypsy wanderings the details of this vagrancy are best learned in his confessions of an english opium-eater where we meet not simply the facts of his life but also the confusion of dreams and fancies in the midst of which he wandered like a man lost on the mountains with storm-clouds under his feet hiding the familiar earth after a year of vagrancy and starvation he was found by his family and allowed to go to oxford where his career was marked by the most brilliant and erratic scholarship when ready for a degree in eighteen o seven he passed his written tests successfully but felt a sudden terror at the thought of the oral examination and disappeared from the university never to return 
it was in oxford that de quincey began the use of opium to relieve the pains of neuralgia and the habit increased until he was an almost hopeless slave to the drug only his extraordinary will-power enabled him to break away from the habit after some thirty years of misery some peculiarity of his delicate constitution enabled de quincey to take enormous quantities of opium enough to kill several ordinary men and it was largely opium working upon a sensitive imagination which produced his gorgeous dreams broken by intervals of weakness and profound depression for twenty years he resided at grasmere in the companionship of the lake poets and here led by the loss of his small fortune he began to write with the idea of supporting his family in eighteen twenty one he published his first famous work the confessions of an english opium eater and for nearly forty years afterwards he wrote industriously contributing to various magazines an astonishing number of essays on a great variety of subjects without thought of literary fame he contributed these articles anonymously but fortunately in eighteen fifty three he began to collect his own works and the last of fourteen volumes was published just after his death in eighteen thirty led by his connection with blackwood's magazine to which he was the chief contributor de quincey removed with his family to edinburgh where his erratic genius and his singularly childlike ways produced enough amusing anecdotes to fill a volume he would take a room in some place unknown to his friends and family would live in it for a few years until he had filled it even to the bathtub with books and with his own chaotic manuscripts allowing no one to enter or disturb his den and then when the place became too crowded he would lock the door and go away and take another lodging where he repeated the same extraordinary performance he died in edinburgh in eighteen fifty nine like lamb he was a small boyish figure gentle and elaborately courteous though excessively shy and escaping as often as possible to solitude he was nevertheless fond of society and his wide knowledge and vivid imagination made his conversations almost as prized as those of his friend coleridge works de quincey's works may be divided into two general classes the first includes his numerous critical articles and the second his autobiographical sketches all his works it must be remembered were contributed to various magazines and were hastily collected just before his death hence the general impression of chaos which we get from reading them critical essays from a literary viewpoint the most illuminating of de quincey's critical works is his literary reminiscences this contains brilliant appreciations of wordsworth coleridge lamb shelley keats hazlitt and landor as well as some interesting studies of the literary figures of the age preceding among the best of his brilliant critical essays are on the knocking at the gate in macbeth eighteen twenty three which is admirably suited to show the man's critical genius and murder considered as one of the fine arts eighteen twenty seven which reveals his grotesque humor other suggestive critical works if one must choose among such a multitude are his letters to a young man eighteen twenty three joan of arc eighteen forty seven the revolt of the tartars eighteen forty and the english mail coach eighteen forty nine in the last named essay the dream fugue is one of the most imaginative of all his curious works confessions of an opium eater etc of de quincey's autobiographical sketches the best known is his confessions of an english opium eater eighteen twenty one this is only partly a record of opium dreams and its chief interest lies in the glimpses it gives us of de quincey's own life and wanderings this should be followed by suspiria de profundis eighteen forty five which is chiefly a record of gloomy and terrible dreams produced by opiates 
the most interesting parts of his suspiria showing de quincey's marvelous insight into dreams are those in which we are brought face to face with the strange feminine creations levana madonna our lady of sighs and our lady of darkness a series of nearly thirty articles which he collected in eighteen fifty three called autobiographic sketches completes the revelation of the author's own life among his miscellaneous works may be mentioned in order to show his wide range of subjects klosterheim a novel logic of political economy the essays on style and rhetoric philosophy of herodotus and his articles on goethe pope schiller and shakespeare which he contributed to the encyclopedia britannica the style of de quincey de quincey's style is a revelation of the beauty of the english language and it profoundly influenced ruskin and other prose writers of the victorian age it has two chief faults diffuseness which continually leads de quincey away from his object and triviality which often makes him halt in the midst of a marvelous paragraph to make some light jest or witticism that has some humor but no mirth in it notwithstanding these faults de quincey's prose is still among the few supreme examples of style in our language though he was profoundly influenced by the seventeenth century writers he attempted definitely to create a new style which should combine the best elements of prose and poetry in consequence his prose works are often like those of milton more imaginative and melodious than much of our poetry he has been well called the psychologist of style and as such his works will never be popular but to the few who can appreciate him he will always be an inspiration to better writing one has a deeper respect for our english language and literature after reading him secondary writers of romanticism one has only to glance back over the authors we have been studying wordsworth coleridge salvey byron shelley keats scott lamb de quincey to realize the great change which swept over the life and literature of england in a single half century under two influences which we now know as the french revolution in history and the romantic movement in literature in life men had rebelled against the too strict authority of state and society in literature they rebelled even more vigorously against the bonds of classicism which had sternly repressed a writer's ambition to follow his own ideals and to express them in his own way naturally such an age of revolution was essentially poetic only the elizabethan age surpasses it in this respect and it produced a large number of minor writers who followed more or less closely the example of its great leaders among novelists we have jane austen francis burney maria edgeworth jane porter and susan ferrier all women be it noted among the poets campbell moore hogg parentheses the ettrick shepherd mrs hamans haber keble hood and ingoldsby parentheses richard barham and among miscellaneous writers sidney smith christopher north parentheses john wilson chalmers lockhart lee hunt hazlitt hallam and lander here is an astonishing variety of writers and to consider all their claims to remembrance would of itself require a volume though these are generally classed as secondary writers much of their work has claims to popularity and some of it to permanence moore's irish melodies campbell's lyrics keble's christian year and jane porter's thaddeus of warsaw and scottish chiefs have still a multitude of readers where keats lamb and de quincey are prized only by the cultured few and hallam's historical and critical works are perhaps better known than those of gibbon who nevertheless occupies a larger place in our literature among all these writers we choose only two jane austen and walter savage landor whose works indicate a period of transition from the romantic to the victorian age 
end of section forty nine section fifty of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten continued jane austen seventeen seventy five eighteen seventeen we have so lately rediscovered the charm and genius of this gifted young woman that she seems to be a novelist of yesterday rather than the contemporary of wordsworth and coleridge and few even of her readers realize that she did for the english novel precisely what the late poets did for english poetry she refined and simplified it making it a true reflection of english life like the late poets she met with scanty encouragement in her own generation her greatest novel pride and prejudice was finished in seventeen ninety seven a year before the appearance of the famous lyrical ballads of wordsworth and coleridge but while the latter book was published and found a few appreciative readers the manuscript of this wonderful novel went begging for sixteen years before it found a publisher as wordsworth began with the deliberate purpose of making poetry natural and truthful so miss austen appears to have begun writing with the idea of presenting the life of english country society exactly as it was in opposition to the romantic extravagance of mrs radcliffe and her school but there was this difference that miss austen had in large measure the saving gift of humor which wordsworth sadly lacked maria edgeworth at the same time set a sane and excellent example in her tales of irish life the absentee and castle rackrent and miss austen followed up the advantage with at least six works which have grown steadily in value until we place them gladly in the first rank of our novels of common life it is not simply for her exquisite charm therefore that we admire her but also for her influence in bringing our novels back to their true place as an expression of human life it is due partly at least to her influence that a multitude of readers were ready to appreciate mrs gaskell's cranford and the powerful and enduring work of george eliot life jane austen's life gives little opportunity for the biographer unless perchance he has something of her own power to show the beauty and charm of commonplace things she was the seventh child of rev george austen rector of steventon and was born in the parsonage of the village in seventeen seventy five with her sisters she was educated at home and passed her life very quietly cheerfully in the doing of small domestic duties to which love lent the magic lamp that makes all things beautiful she began to write at an early age and seems to have done her work on a little table in the family sitting-room in the midst of the family life when a visitor entered she would throw a paper or a piece of sewing over her work and she modestly refused to be known as the author of novels which we now count among our treasured possessions with the publishers she had little success pride and prejudice went begging as we have said for sixteen years and north hanger abbey seventeen ninety eight was sold for a trivial sum to a publisher who laid it aside and forgot it until the appearance and moderate success of sense and sensibility in eighteen eleven then after keeping the manuscript some fifteen years he sold it back to the family who found another publisher an anonymous article in the quarterly review following the appearance of emma in eighteen fifteen full of generous appreciation of the charm of the new writer was the beginning of jane austen's fame and it is only within a few years that we have learned that the friendly and discerning critic was walter scott he continued to be her admirer until her early death but these two the greatest writers of fiction in their age were never brought together both were home-loving people and miss austen especially was averse to publicity and popularity she died quietly as she had lived at winchester in eighteen seventeen and was buried in the cathedral she was a bright attractive little woman whose sunny qualities are unconsciously reflected in all her books 
works very few english writers ever had so narrow a field of work as jane austen like the french novelists whose success seems to lie in choosing the tiny field that they know best her works have an exquisite perfection that is lacking in most of our writers of fiction with the exception of an occasional visit to the watering place of bath her whole life was spent in small country parishes whose simple country people became the characters of her novels her brothers were in the navy and so naval officers furnish the only exciting elements in her stories but even these alleged heroes lay aside their imposing martial ways and act like themselves and other people such was her literary field in which the chief duties were of the household the chief pleasures in country gatherings and the chief interests in matrimony life with its mighty interests its passions ambitions and tragic struggles swept by like a great river while the secluded interests of a country parish went round and round quietly like an eddy behind a sheltering rock we can easily understand therefore the limitations of jane austen but within her own field she is unequalled her characters are absolutely true to life and all her work has the perfection of a delicate miniature painting the most widely read of her novels is pride and prejudice but three others sense and sensibility emma and mansfield park have slowly won their way to the front rank of fiction from a literary viewpoint northanger abbey is perhaps the best for in it we find that touch of humor and delicate satire with which this gentle little woman combated the grotesque popular novels of the udolpho type reading any of these works one is inclined to accept the hearty endorsement of sir walter scott that young lady has a talent for describing the involvements and feelings and characters of ordinary life which is to me the most wonderful i ever met with the big bow-wow strain i can do myself like any now going but the exquisite touch which renders ordinary commonplace things and characters interesting from the truth of the description and the sentiment is denied to me what a pity such a gifted creature died so early walter savage landor seventeen seventy five eighteen sixty four while hazlitt lamb de quincey and other romantic critics went back to early english literature for their inspiration landor shows a reaction from the prevailing romanticism by his imitation of the ancient classic writers his life was an extraordinary one and like his work abounded in sharp contrasts on the one hand there are his egoism his uncontrollable anger his perpetual lawsuits and the last sad tragedy with his children which suggests king lear and his daughters on the other hand there is his steady devotion to the classics and to the cultivation of the deep wisdom of the ancients which suggests pindar and cicero in his works we find the wild extravagance of jabir followed by the superb classic style and charm of pericles and aspasia such was landor a man of high ideals perpetually at war with himself and the world life landor's stormy life covers the whole period from wordsworth's childhood to the middle of the victorian era he was the son of a physician and was born at warwick in seventeen seventy five from his mother he inherited a fortune but it was soon scattered by large expenditures and law quarrels and in his old age refused help by his own children only browning's generosity kept landor from actual want at rugby and at oxford his extreme republicanism brought him into constant trouble and his fitting out a band of volunteers to assist the spaniards against napoleon in eighteen o eight allies him with byron and his quixotic followers the resemblance to byron is even more strikingly shown in the poem jabir published in seventeen ninety eight a year made famous by the lyrical ballads of wordsworth and coleridge a remarkable change in lander's life is noticeable in eighteen twenty one when at forty-six years of age 
after having lost his magnificent estate at lanthony abbey in glamorganshire and after a stormy experience in como he settled down for a time at fiesole near florence to this period of calm after storm we owe the classical prose works for which he is famous the calm like that at the centre of a whirlwind lasted but a short time and landor leaving his family in great anger returned to bath where he lived alone for more than twenty years then in order to escape a libel suit the choleric old man fled back to italy he died at florence in eighteen sixty four the spirit of his whole life may be inferred from the defiant farewell which he flung to it i strove with none for none was worthy of my strife nature i loved and next to nature art i warmed both hands before the fire of life it sinks and i am ready to depart works landor's reaction from romanticism is all the more remarkable in view of his early efforts such as jabir a wildly romantic poem which rivals any work of byron or shelley in its extravagance notwithstanding its occasional beautiful and suggestive lines the work was not and never has been successful and the same may be said of all his poetical works his first collection of poems was published in seventeen ninety five his last a full half century later in eighteen forty six in the latter volume the hellenics which included some translations of his earlier latin poems called idilia eroica one has only to read the hamadryad and compare it with the lyrics of the first volume in order to realize the astonishing literary vigor of a man who published two volumes a half century apart without any appreciable diminution of poetical feeling in all these poems one is impressed by the striking and original figures of speech which lander uses to emphasize his meaning it is by his prose works largely that lander has won a place in our literature partly because of their intrinsic worth their penetrating thought and severe classic style and partly because of their profound influence upon the writers of the present age the most noted of his prose works are his six volumes of imaginary conversations eighteen twenty four eighteen forty six for these conversations landor brings together sometimes in groups sometimes in couples well-known characters or rather shadows from the four corners of the earth and from the remotest ages of recorded history thus diogenes talks with plato aesop with a young slave girl in egypt henry the eighth with anne boleyn in prison dante with beatrice leofric with lady godiva all these and many others from epictetus to cromwell are brought together and speak of life and love and death each from his own viewpoint occasionally as in the meeting of henry and anne boleyn the situation is tense and dramatic but as a rule the characters simply meet and converse in the same quiet strain which becomes after much reading somewhat monotonous on the other hand one who reads the imaginary conversations is lifted at once into a calm and noble atmosphere which braces and inspires him making him forget petty things like a view from a hilltop by its combination of lofty thought and severely classic style the book has won and deserves a very high place among our literary records the same criticism applies to pericles and aspasia which is a series of imaginary letters telling the experiences of aspasia a young lady from asia minor who visits athens at the summit of its fame and glory in the great age of pericles this is in our judgment the best worth reading of all landor's works one gets from it not only landor's classic style but what is well worth while a better picture of greece in the days of its greatness than can be obtained from many historical volumes summary of the age of romanticism this period extends from the war with the colonies following the declaration of independence in seventeen seventy six to the accession of victoria in eighteen thirty seven 
both limits being indefinite as will be seen by a glance at the chronology following during the first part of the period especially england was in a continual turmoil produced by political and economic agitation at home and by the long wars that covered two continents and the wide sea between them the mighty changes resulting from these two causes have given this period the name of the age of revolution the storm centre of all the turmoil at home and abroad was the french revolution which had a profound influence on the life and literature of all europe on the continent the overthrow of napoleon at waterloo eighteen fifteen apparently checked the progress of liberty which had started with the french revolution but in england the case was reversed the agitation for popular liberty which at one time threatened a revolution went steadily forward till it resulted in the final triumph of democracy in the reform bill of eighteen thirty two and in a number of exceedingly important reforms such as the extension of manhood suffrage the removal of the last unjust restrictions against catholics the establishment of a national system of schools followed by a rapid increase in popular education and the abolition of slavery in all english colonies eighteen thirty three to this we must add the changes produced by the discovery of steam and the invention of machinery which rapidly changed england from an agricultural to a manufacturing nation introduced the factory system and caused this period to be known as the age of industrial revolution the literature of the age is largely poetical in form and almost entirely romantic in spirit for as we have noted the triumph of democracy in government is generally accompanied by the triumph of romanticism in literature at first the literature as shown especially in the early work of wordsworth byron and shelley reflected the turmoil of the age and the wild hopes of an ideal democracy occasioned by the french revolution later the extravagant enthusiasm subsided and english writers produced so much excellent literature that the age is often called the second creative period the first being the age of elizabeth the six chief characteristics of the age are the prevalence of romantic poetry the creation of the historical novel by scott the first appearance of women novelists such as mrs anne radcliffe jane porter maria edgeworth and jane austen the development of literary criticism in the work of lamb de quincey coleridge and hazlitt the practical and economic bent of philosophy as shown in the works of malthus james mill and adam smith and the establishment of great literary magazines like the edinburgh review the quarterly blackwoods and the athenaeum in our study we have noted one the poets of romanticism the importance of the lyrical ballads of seventeen ninety eight the life and work of wordsworth coleridge scott byron shelley and keats two the prose writers the novels of scott the development of literary criticism the life and work of the essayists lamb de quincey landor and of the novelist jane austen suggestive questions note in a period like the age of romanticism the poems and essays chosen for special study vary so widely that only a few general questions on the selections for reading are attempted one why is this period of romanticism seventeen eighty nine eighteen thirty seven called the age of revolution give some reasons for the influence of the french revolution on english literature and illustrate from poems or essays which you have read explain the difference between classicism and romanticism which of these two types of literature do you prefer two what are the general characteristics of the literature of this period what two opposing tendencies are illustrated in the novels of scott and jane austen in the poetry of byron and wordsworth three wordsworth tell briefly the story of wordsworth's life and name some of his best poems 
why do the lyrical ballads 1798 mark an important literary epoch read carefully and make an analysis of the intimations of immortality of tintern abbey can you explain what political conditions are referred to in wordsworth's sonnet on milton in his french revolution does he attempt to paint a picture in his sonnet on westminster bridge or has he some other object in view what is the general teaching of the ode to duty compare wordsworth's two skylark poems with shelley's make a brief comparison between wordsworth's sonnets and those of shakespeare and of milton having in mind the thought the melody the view of nature and the imagery of the three poets quote from wordsworth's poems to show his belief that nature is conscious to show the influence of nature on man to show his interest in children his sensitiveness to sounds to illustrate the chastening influence of sorrow make a brief comparison between the characters of wordsworth's michael and of burns the cotter's saturday night compare wordsworth's point of view and method in the three poems to a daisy with burns view as expressed in his famous lines on the same subjects for coleridge what are the general characteristics of coleridge's life what explains the profound sympathy for humanity that is reflected in his poems for what beside his poems is he remarkable can you quote any passages from his poetry which show the influence of wordsworth what are the characters in the ancient mariner in what respect is this poem romantic give your own reasons for its popularity does the thought or the style of this poem impress you if you have read any of the lectures on shakespeare explain why coleridge's work is called romantic criticism five scott tell the story of scott's life and name his chief poems and novels do you recall any passage from his poetry which suggests his own heroism why was he called the wizard of the north what is the general character of his poetry compare marmion with one of the old ballads having in mind the characters the dramatic interest of the story and the style of writing in what sense is he the creator of the historical novel upon what does he depend to hold the reader's attention compare him in this respect with jane austen which of his characters impress you as being the most lifelike name any novels of the present day which copy scott or show his influence read ivanhoe and the lady of the lake make a brief analysis of each work having in mind the style the plot the dramatic interest the use of adventure and the truth to nature of the different characters six byron why is byron called the revolutionary poet illustrate if possible from his poetry what is the general character of his work in what kind of poetry does he excel quote from child harold to illustrate your opinion describe the typical byronic hero can you explain his great popularity at first and his subsequent loss of influence why is he still popular on the continent do you find more of thought or of emotion in his poetry compare him in this respect with shelley with wordsworth which is the more brilliant writer byron or wordsworth which has the more humor which has the healthier mind which has the higher ideal of poetry which is the more inspiring and helpful is it fair to say that byron's quality is power not charm seven shelley what are the chief characteristics of shelley's poetry is it most remarkable for its thought form or imagery what poems show the influence of the french revolution what subjects are considered in lines written among the eugenian hills what does shelley try to teach in the sensitive plant compare shelley's view of nature as reflected in the cloud or the west wind with wordsworth's view as reflected in the prelude 
tintern abbey daffodils etc to what class of poems does adonais belong what is the subject of the poem name others of the same class how does shelley describe himself in this poem compare shelley's adonais and milton's lycidas with regard to the view of life after death as expressed in the poems what kinds of scenes does shelley like best to describe compare his characters with those of wordsworth of byron do you recall any poems in which he writes of ordinary people or of ordinary experiences eight keats what is the essence of keats poetical creed as expressed in the ode on a grecian urn what are the remarkable elements in his life and work what striking difference do you find between his early poems and those of shelley and byron what are the chief subjects of his verse what poems show the influence of the classics of elizabethan literature can you explain why his work has been called literary poetry keats and shelley are generally classed together what similarities do you find in their poems give some reasons why keats introduces the old beadsman in the eve of st agnes name some of the literary friends mentioned in keats poetry compare keats characters with those of wordsworth of byron does keats ever remind you of spencer in what respects is your personal preference for wordsworth byron shelley or keats why nine lamb tell briefly the story of lamb's life and name his principal works why is he called the most human of essayists his friends call him the last of the elizabethans why what is the general character of the essays of elia how is the personality of lamb shown in all these essays cite any passages showing lamb's skill in portraying people make a brief comparison between lamb and addison having in mind the subjects treated the style the humor and the interest of both essayists which do you prefer and why ten de quincey what are the general characteristics of de quincey's essays explain why he is called the psychologist of style what accounts for a certain unreal element in all his work read a passage from the english mail coach or from joan of arc or from levana our lady of sorrows and comment freely upon it with regard to style ideas interest and the impression of reality or unreality which it leaves eleven landor in what respects does landor show a reaction from romanticism what qualities make landor's poems stand out so clearly in the memory why for instance do you think lamb was so haunted by rose aylmer quote from landor's poems to illustrate his tenderness his sensitiveness to beauty his power of awakening emotion his delicacy of characterization do you find the same qualities in his prose can you explain why much of his prose seems like a translation from the greek compare a passage from the imaginary conversations with a passage from gibbon or johnson to show the difference between the classic and the pseudo-classic style compare one of landor's characters in imaginary conversations with the same character in history twelve jane austen how does jane austen show a reaction from romanticism what important work did she do for the novel to what kind of fiction was her work opposed in what does the charm of her novels consist make a brief comparison between jane austen and scott as illustrated in pride and prejudice and ivanhoe having in mind the subject the characters the manner of treatment and the interest of both narratives do jane austen's characters have to be explained by the author or do they explain themselves which method calls for the greater literary skill what does jane austen say about mrs radcliffe in northanger abbey does she make any other observations on eighteenth-century novelists chronology 
end of the eighteenth and beginning of the nineteenth century history seventeen sixty eighteen twenty george the third seventeen eighty nine seventeen ninety nine french revolution eighteen hundred union of great britain and ireland eighteen o two colonization of australia eighteen o five battle of trafalgar eighteen o seven abolition of slave trade eighteen o eight eighteen fourteen peninsular war eighteen twelve second war with united states eighteen fourteen congress of vienna eighteen fifteen battle of waterloo eighteen nineteen first atlantic steamship eighteen twenty george the fourth death eighteen thirty eighteen twenty six first temperance society eighteen twenty nine catholic emancipation bill eighteen thirty william the fourth death eighteen thirty seven first railway eighteen thirty two reform bill eighteen thirty three emancipation of slaves eighteen thirty four system of national education eighteen thirty seven victoria death nineteen o one literature seventeen seventy eighteen fifty wordsworth seventeen seventy one eighteen thirty two scott seventeen ninety six eighteen sixteen jane austen's novels seventeen ninety eight lyrical ballads of wordsworth and coleridge eighteen o two scott's minstrelsy of the scottish border eighteen o five eighteen seventeen scott's poems eighteen o seven wordsworth's intimations of immortality lamb's tales from shakespeare eighteen o nine eighteen eighteen byron's child harold eighteen ten eighteen thirteen coleridge's lectures on shakespeare eighteen fourteen eighteen thirty one waverley novels eighteen sixteen shelley's alastor eighteen seventeen coleridge's biographia literaria eighteen seventeen eighteen twenty keats poems eighteen 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 twenty shelley's prometheus eighteen twenty wordsworth's dudden's sonnets eighteen twenty eighteen thirty three lamb's essays of elia eighteen twenty one de quincey's confessions eighteen twenty four eighteen forty six landor's imaginary conversations eighteen thirty tennyson's first poems eighteen thirty one scott's last novel eighteen thirty three carlyle's sartor resartus browning's pauline eighteen fifty three eighteen sixty one de quincey's collected essays end of section fifty end of chapter ten section fifty one of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven the victorian age eighteen fifty nineteen hundred the modern period of progress and unrest when victoria became queen in eighteen thirty seven english literature seemed to have entered upon a period of lean years in marked contrast with the poetic fruitfulness of the romantic age which we have just studied coleridge shelley keats byron and scott had passed away and it seemed as if there were no writers in england to fill their places wordsworth had written in eighteen thirty five like clouds that rake the mountain summits or waves that own no curbing hand how fast has brother followed brother from sunshine to sunless land in these lines is reflected the sorrowful spirit of a literary man of the early nineteenth century who remembered the glory that had passed away from the earth but the leanness of these first years is more apparent than real 
keats and shelley were dead it is true but already there had appeared three disciples of these poets who were destined to be far more widely read than were their masters tennyson had been publishing poetry since eighteen twenty seven his first poems appearing almost simultaneously with the last work of byron shelley and keats but it was not until eighteen forty two with the publication of his collected poems in two volumes that england recognized in him one of her great literary leaders so also elizabeth barrett had been writing since eighteen twenty but not till twenty years later did her poems become deservedly popular and browning had published his pauline in eighteen thirty three but it was not until eighteen forty six when he published the last of the series called bells and pomegranates that the reading public began to appreciate his power and originality moreover even as romanticism seemed passing away a group of great prose writers dickens thackeray carlyle and ruskin had already begun to proclaim the literary glory of a new age which now seems to rank only just below the elizabethan and the romantic periods democracy historical summary amid the multitude of social and political forces of this great age four things stand out clearly first the long struggle of the anglo-saxons for personal liberty is definitely settled and democracy becomes the established order of the day the king who appeared in an age of popular weakness and ignorance and the peers who came with the normans in triumph are both stripped of their power and left as figureheads of a past civilization the last vestige of personal government and of divine right of rulers disappears the house of commons becomes the ruling power in england and a series of new reform bills rapidly extend the suffrage until the whole body of english people choose for themselves the men who shall represent them social unrest second because it is an age of democracy it is an age of popular education of religious tolerance of growing brotherhood and of profound social unrest the slaves had been freed in eighteen thirty three but in the middle of the century england awoke to the fact that slaves are not necessarily negroes stolen in africa to be sold like cattle in the market-place but that multitudes of men women and little children in the mines and factories were victims of a more terrible industrial and social slavery to free these slaves also the unwilling victims of our unnatural competitive methods has been the growing purpose of the victorian age until the present day the ideal of peace third because it is an age of democracy and education it is an age of comparative peace england begins to think less of the pomp and false glitter of fighting and more of its moral evils as the nation realizes that it is the common people who bear the burden and the sorrow and the poverty of war while the privileged classes reap most of the financial and political rewards moreover with the growth of trade and of friendly foreign relations it becomes evident that the social equality for which england was contending at home belongs to the whole race of men that brotherhood is universal not insular that a question of justice is never settled by fighting and that war is generally unmitigated horror and barbarism tennyson who came of age when the great reform bill occupied attention expresses the ideals of the liberals of his day who proposed to spread the gospel of peace till the war drum throbbed no longer and the battle flags were furled in the parliament of man the federation of the world arts and sciences fourth the victorian age is especially remarkable because of its rapid progress in all the arts and sciences and in mechanical inventions a glance at any record of the industrial achievements of the nineteenth century will show how vast they are and it is unnecessary to repeat here the list of the inventions from spinning-looms to steamboats 
and from matches to electric lights all these material things as well as the growth of education have their influence upon the life of a people and it is inevitable that they should react upon its prose and poetry though as yet we are too much absorbed in our sciences and mechanics to determine accurately their influence upon literature when these new things shall by long use have become familiar as country roads or have been replaced by newer and better things then they also will have their associations and memories and a poem on the railroads may be as suggestive as wordsworth's sonnet on westminster bridge and the busy practical working men who to-day throng our streets and factories may seem to a future and greater age as quaint and poetical as to us seem the slow toilers of the middle ages an age of prose literary characteristics when one is interested enough to trace the genealogy of victoria he finds to his surprise that in her veins flowed the blood both of william the conqueror and of serdic the first saxon king of england and this seems to be symbolic of the literature of her age which embraces the whole realm of saxon and norman life the strength and ideals of the one and the culture and refinement of the other the romantic revival had done its work and england entered upon a new free period in which every form of literature from pure romance to gross realism struggled for expression at this day it is obviously impossible to judge the age as a whole but we are getting far enough away from the early half of it to notice certain definite characteristics first though the age produced many poets and two who deserve to rank among the greatest nevertheless this is emphatically an age of prose and since the number of readers has increased a thousandfold with the spread of popular education it is the age of the newspaper the magazine and the modern novel the first two being the story of the world's daily life and the last our pleasantest form of literary entertainment as well as our most successful method of presenting modern problems and modern ideals the novel in this age fills a place which the drama held in the days of elizabeth and never before in any age or language has the novel appeared in such numbers and in such perfection moral purpose the second marked characteristic of the age is that literature both in prose and in poetry seems to depart from the purely artistic standard of art for art's sake and to be actuated by a definite moral purpose tennyson browning carlyle ruskin who and what were these men if not the teachers of england not vaguely but definitely with superb faith in their message and with the conscious moral purpose to uplift and to instruct even the novel breaks away from scott's romantic influence and first studies life as it is and then points out what life may and ought to be whether we read the fun and sentiment of dickens the social miniatures of thackeray or the psychological studies of george eliot we find in almost every case a definite purpose to sweep away error and to reveal the underlying truth of human life so the novel sought to do for society in this age precisely what lyell and darwin sought to do for science that is to find the truth and to show how it might be used to uplift humanity perhaps for this reason the victorian age is emphatically an age of realism rather than of romance not the realism of zola and ibsen but a deeper realism which strives to tell the whole truth showing moral and physical diseases as they are but holding up health and hope as the normal conditions of humanity idealism it is somewhat customary to speak of this age as an age of doubt and pessimism following the new conception of man and of the universe which was formulated by science under the name of involution it is spoken of also as a prosaic age lacking in great ideals 
both these criticisms seem to be the result of judging a large thing when we are too close to it to get its true proportions just as cologne cathedral one of the world's most perfect structures seems to be a shapeless pile of stone when we stand too close beneath its mighty walls and buttresses tennyson's immature work like that of the minor poets is sometimes in a doubtful or despairing strain but his in memoriam is like a rainbow after storm and browning seems better to express the spirit of his age in the strong manly faith of rabbi ben ezra and in the courageous optimism of all his poetry stedman's victorian anthology is on the whole a most inspiring book of poetry it would be hard to collect more varied cheer from any age and the great essayists like macaulay carlyle ruskin and the great novelists like dickens thackeray george eliot generally leave us with a larger charity and with a deeper faith in our humanity so also the judgment that this age is too practical for great ideals may be only a description of the husk that hides a very full ear of corn it is well to remember that spencer and sidney judged their own age which we now consider to be the greatest in our literary history to be altogether given over to materialism and to be incapable of literary greatness just as time has made us smile at their blindness so the next century may correct our judgment of this as a material age and looking upon the enormous growth of charity and brotherhood among us and at the literature which expresses our faith in men may judge the victorian age to be on the whole the noblest and most inspiring in the history of the world end of section fifty one section fifty two of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven continued part one the poets of the victorian age alfred tennyson eighteen o nine eighteen ninety two o young mariner you from the haven under the sea cliff you that are watching the gray magician with eyes of wonder i am merlin and i am dying i am merlin who follow the gleam o oh, young mariner down to the haven call your companions launch your vessel and crowd your canvas and ere it vanishes over the margin after it follow it follow the gleam one who reads this haunting poem of merlin and the gleam finds in it a suggestion of the spirit of the poet's whole life his devotion to the ideal as expressed in poetry his early romantic impressions his struggles doubts triumphs and his thrilling message to his race throughout the entire victorian period tennyson stood at the summit of poetry in england not in vain was he appointed laureate at the death of wordsworth in eighteen fifty for almost alone among those who have held the office he felt the importance of his place and filled it and honored it for nearly half a century tennyson was not only a man and a poet he was a voice the voice of a whole people expressing in exquisite melody their doubts and their faith their griefs and their triumphs in the wonderful variety of his verse he suggests all the qualities of england's greatest poets the dreaminess of spencer the majesty of milton the natural simplicity of wordsworth the fantasy of blake and coleridge the melody of keats and shelley the narrative vigor of scott and byron all these striking qualities are evident on successive pages of tennyson's poetry the only thing lacking is the dramatic power of the elizabethans in reflecting the restless spirit of this progressive age tennyson is as remarkable as pope was in voicing the artificiality of the early eighteenth century 
as a poet therefore who expresses not so much a personal as a national spirit he is probably the most representative literary man of the victorian era life tennyson's life is a remarkable one in this respect that from beginning to end he seems to have been dominated by a single impulse the impulse of poetry he had no large or remarkable experiences no wild oats to sow no great successes or reverses no business cares or public offices for sixty-six years from the appearance of the poems by two brothers in eighteen twenty seven until his death in eighteen ninety two he studied and practised his art continually and exclusively only browning his fellow-worker resembles him in this but the differences in the two men are world-wide tennyson was naturally shy retiring indifferent to men hating noise and publicity loving to be alone with nature like wordsworth browning was sociable delighting in applause in society in travel in the noise and bustle of the big world tennyson was born in the rectory of somersby lincolnshire in eighteen o nine the sweet influences of his early natural surroundings can be better understood from his early poems than from any biography he was one of the twelve children of the rev george clayton tennyson a scholarly clergyman and his wife elizabeth fitch a gentle lovable woman not learned save in gracious household ways to whom the poet pays a son's loyal tribute near the close of the princess it is interesting to note that most of these children were poetically inclined and that two of the brothers charles and frederick gave far greater promise than did alfred when seven years old the boy went to his grandmother's house at luth in order to attend a famous grammar school at that place not even a man's memory which generally makes light of hardship and glorifies early experiences could ever soften tennyson's hatred of school life his complaint was not so much at the roughness of the boys which had so frightened cowper as at the brutality of the teachers who put over the school door a wretched latin inscription translating solomon's barbarous advice about the rod and the child in these psychologic days when the child is more important than the curriculum and when we teach girls and boys rather than latin and arithmetic we read with wonder carlyle's description of his own schoolmaster evidently a type of his kind who knew of the human soul thus much that it had a faculty called memory and could be acted on through the muscular integument by appliance of birch rods after four years of most unsatisfactory school life tennyson returned home and was fitted for the university by his scholarly father with his brothers he wrote many verses and his first efforts appeared in a little volume called poems by two brothers in eighteen twenty seven the next year he entered trinity college cambridge where he became the centre of a brilliant circle of friends chief of whom was the young poet arthur henry hallam at the university tennyson soon became known for his poetical ability and two years after his entrance he gained the prize of the chancellor's medal for a poem called timbuktu the subject needless to say being chosen by the chancellor soon after winning this honor tennyson published his first signed work called poems chiefly lyrical eighteen thirty which though it seems somewhat crude and disappointing to us now nevertheless contained the germ of all his later poetry one of the most noticeable things in this volume is the influence which byron evidently exerted over the poet in his early days it was perhaps due largely to the same romantic influence that tennyson and his friend hallam presently sailed away to spain with the idea of joining the army of insurgents against king ferdinand 
considered purely as a revolutionary venture this was something of a fiasco suggesting the noble duke of york and his ten thousand men he marched them up a hill one day and he marched them down again from a literary viewpoint however the experience was not without its value the deep impression which the wild beauty of the pyrenees made upon the young poet's mind is reflected clearly in the poem enoni in eighteen thirty one tennyson left the university without taking his degree the reasons for this step are not clear but the family was poor and poverty may have played a large part in his determination his father died a few months later but by a generous arrangement with the new rector the family retained the rectory at somersby and here for nearly six years tennyson lived in a retirement which strongly suggests milton at horton he read and studied widely cultivated an intimate acquaintance with nature thought deeply on the problems suggested by the reform bill which was then agitating england and during his leisure hours wrote poetry the first fruits of this retirement appeared late in eighteen thirty two in a wonderful little volume bearing the simple name poems as the work of a youth only twenty-three this book is remarkable for the variety and melody of its verse among its treasures we still read with delight the lotus cedars palace of art a dream of fair women the miller's daughter enoni and the lady of shallot but the critics of the quarterly who had brutally condemned his earlier work were again unmercifully severe the effect of this harsh criticism upon a sensitive nature was most unfortunate and when his friend hallam died in eighteen thirty three tennyson was plunged into a period of gloom and sorrow the sorrow may be read in the exquisite little poem beginning break 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 on thy cold gray stones o sea which was his first published elegy for his friend and the depressing influence of the harsh and unjust criticism is suggested in merlin and the gleam which the reader will understand only after he has read tennyson's biography for nearly ten years after hallam's death tennyson published nothing and his movements are hard to trace as the family went here and there seeking peace and a home in various parts of england but though silent he continued to write poetry and it was in these sad wandering days that he began his immortal in memoriam and his idols of the king in eighteen forty two his friends persuaded him to give his work to the world and with some hesitation he published his poems the success of this work was almost instantaneous and we can appreciate the favor with which it was received when we read the noble blank verse of ulysses and mort d'arthur the perfect little song of grief for hallam which we have already mentioned and the exquisite idols like dora and the gardener's daughter which aroused even wordsworth's enthusiasm and brought from him a letter saying that he had been trying all his life to write such an english pastoral as dora and had failed from this time forward tennyson with increasing confidence in himself and his message steadily maintained his place as the best known and best loved poet in england the year eighteen fifty was a happy one for tennyson he was appointed poet laureate to succeed wordsworth and he married emily selwood her whose gentle will has changed my fate and made my life a perfumed altar flame whom he had loved for thirteen years but whom his poverty had prevented him from marrying the year is made further remarkable by the publication of in memoriam probably the most enduring of his poems upon which he had worked at intervals for sixteen years three years later with the money that his work now brought him he leased the house farringford in the isle of wight and settled in the first permanent home he had known since he left the rectory at somersby 
for the remaining forty years of his life he lived like wordsworth in the stillness of a great peace writing steadily and enjoying the friendship of a large number of people some distinguished some obscure from the kindly and sympathetic victoria to the servants of his own farm all of these he called with equal sincerity his friends and to each one he was the same man simple strong kindly and noble carlyle describes him as a fine large-featured dim-eyed bronze-colored shaggy-headed man most restful brotherly solid-hearted loving solitude and hating publicity as he did the numerous tourists from both sides of the ocean who sought him out in his retreat and insisted upon seeing him made his life at times intolerable influenced partly by the desire to escape such popularity he bought land and built for himself a new house aldworth in surrey though he made his home in farringford for the greater part of the year his labor during these years and his marvelous freshness and youthfulness of feeling are best understood by a glance at the contents of his complete works inferior poems like the princess which was written in the first flush of his success and his dramas which were written against the advice of his best friends may easily be criticized but the bulk of his verse shows an astonishing originality and vigor to the very end he died very quietly at aldworth with his family about him in the moonlight and beside him a volume of shakespeare open at the dirge in cymbeline fear no more the heat o the sun nor the furious winter's rages thou thy worldly task hast done home art gone and ta'en thy wages the strong and noble spirit of his life is reflected in one of his best-known poems crossing the bar which was written in his eighty-first year and which he desired should be placed at the end of his collected works sunset and evening star and one clear call for me and may there be no moaning of the bar when i put out to sea but such a tide as moving seems asleep too full for sound and foam when that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again home twilight and evening bell and after that the dark and may there be no sadness of farewell when i embark for though from out our born of time and place the flood may bear me far i hope to see my pilot face to face when i have crossed the bar works at the outset of our study of tennyson's works it may be well to record two things by way of suggestion first tennyson's poetry is not so much to be studied as to be read and appreciated he is a poet to have open on one's table and to enjoy as one enjoys his daily exercise and second we should by all means begin to get acquainted with tennyson in the days of our youth unlike browning who is generally appreciated by more mature minds tennyson is for enjoyment for inspiration rather than for instruction only youth can fully appreciate him and youth unfortunately except in a few rare beautiful cases is something which does not dwell with us long after our school days the secret of poetry especially of tennyson's poetry is to be eternally young and like adam in paradise to find every morning a new world fresh wonderful inspiring as if just from the hands of god early poems and dramas except by the student eager to understand the whole range of poetry in this age tennyson's earlier poems and his later dramas may well be omitted opinions vary about both but the general judgment seems to be that the earlier poems show too much of byron's influence and their crudeness suffers by comparison with the exquisitely finished work of tennyson's middle life of dramatic works he wrote seven his great ambition being to present a large part of the history of england in a series of dramas becket was one of the best of these works and met with considerable favor on the stage 
but like all the others it indicates that tennyson lacked the dramatic power and the humor necessary for a successful playwright the princess and maud among the remaining poems there is such a wide variety that every reader must be left largely to follow his own delightful choice note an excellent little volume for the beginner is van dyck's poems by tennyson which shows the entire range of the poet's work from his earliest to his latest years see selections for reading at the end of this chapter end of note of the poems of eighteen forty two we have already mentioned those best worth reading the princess a medley eighteen forty seven a long poem of over three thousand lines of blank verse is tennyson's answer to the question of woman's rights and woman's sphere which was then as in our own day strongly agitating the public mind in this poem a baby finally solves the problem which philosophers have pondered ever since men began to think connectedly about human society a few exquisite songs like tears idle tears bugle song and sweet and low form the most delightful part of this poem which in general is hardly up to the standard of the poet's later work maud eighteen fifty five is what is called in literature a monodrama telling the story of a lover who passes from morbidness to ecstasy then to anger and murder followed by insanity and recovery this was tennyson's favorite and among his friends he read aloud from it more than from any other poem perhaps if we could hear tennyson read it we should appreciate it better but on the whole it seems overwrought and melodramatic even its lyrics like come into the garden maud which make this work a favorite with young lovers are characterized by prettiness rather than by beauty or strength in memoriam perhaps the most loved of all tennyson's works is in memoriam which on account of both its theme and its exquisite workmanship is one of the few immortal names that were not born to die the immediate occasion of this remarkable poem was tennyson's profound personal grief at the death of his friend hallam as he wrote lyric after lyric inspired by this sad subject the poet's grief became less personal and the greater grief of humanity mourning for its dead and questioning its immortality took possession of him gradually the poem became an expression first of universal doubt and then of universal faith a faith which rests ultimately not on reason or philosophy but on the soul's instinct for immortality the immortality of human love is the theme of the poem which is made up of over one hundred different lyrics the movement takes us through three years rising slowly from poignant sorrow and doubt to a calm peace and hope and ending with a noble hymn of courage and faith a modest courage and a humble faith love inspired which will be a favorite as long as saddened men turn to literature for consolation though darwin's greatest books had not yet been written science had already overturned many old conceptions of life and tennyson who lived apart and thought deeply on all the problems of his day gave this poem to the world as his own answer to the doubts and questionings of men this universal human interest together with its exquisite form and melody make the poem in popular favor at least the supreme threnody or elegiac poem of our literature though milton's lycidas is from the critical viewpoint undoubtedly a more artistic work idols of the king the idols of the king ranks among the greatest of tennyson's later works its general subject is the celtic legends of king arthur and his knights of the round table and the chief source of its material is mallory's mort d'arthur here in this mass of beautiful legends is certainly the subject of a great national epic 
yet after four hundred years during which many poets have used the material the great epic is still unwritten milton and spencer as we have already noted considered this material carefully and milton alone of all english writers had perhaps the power to use it in a great epic tennyson began to use these legends in his mort d'arthur eighteen forty two but the epic idea probably occurred to him later in eighteen fifty six when he began gerent and enid and he added the stories of vivian elaine guinevere and other heroes and heroines at intervals until balen the last of the idols appeared in eighteen eighty five later these works were gathered together and arranged with an attempt at unity the result is in no sense an epic poem but rather a series of single poems loosely connected by a thread of interest in arthur the central personage and in his unsuccessful attempt to found an ideal kingdom english idols entirely different in spirit is another collection of poems called english idols note tennyson made a distinction in spelling between the idols i d y l l s of the king and the english idols i d y l s like dora end of note which began in the poems of eighteen forty two and which tennyson intended should reflect the ideals of widely different types of english life of these varied poems dora the gardener's daughter ulysses locksley hall and sir galahad are the best but all are worthy of study one of the most famous of this series is enoch arden eighteen sixty four in which tennyson turns from medieval knights from lords heroes and fair ladies to find the material for true poetry among the lowly people that make up the bulk of english life its rare melody its sympathy for common life and its revelation of the beauty and heroism which hide in humble men and women everywhere made this work an instant favorite judged by its sales alone it was the most popular of his works during the poet's lifetime tennyson's later volumes like the ballads eighteen eighty and demeter eighteen eighty nine should not be overlooked since they contain some of his best work the former contains stirring war songs like the defense of lucknow and pictures of wild passionate grief like rizpa the latter is notable for romney's remorse a wonderful piece of work merlin and the gleam which expresses the poet's lifelong ideal and several exquisite little songs like the throstle and the oak which show how marvelously the aged poet retained his youthful freshness and inspiration here certainly is variety enough to give us long years of literary enjoyment and we need hardly mention miscellaneous poems like the brook and the charge of the light brigade which are known to every schoolboy and wages and the higher pantheism which should be read by every man who thinks about the old old problem of life and death characteristics of tennyson's poetry if we attempt to sum up the quality of tennyson as shown in all these works the task is a difficult one but three things stand out more or less plainly first tennyson is essentially the artist no other in his age studied the art of poetry so constantly or with such singleness of purpose and only swinburne rivals him in melody and the perfect finish of his verse second like all the great writers of his age he is emphatically a teacher often a leader in the preceding age as the result of the turmoil produced by the french revolution lawlessness was more or less common and individuality was the rule in literature tennyson's theme so characteristic of his age is the reign of order of law in the physical world producing evolution and of law in the spiritual world working out the perfect man 
in memoriam idols of the king the princess here are three widely different poems yet the theme of each so far as poetry is a kind of spiritual philosophy and weighs its words before it utters them is the orderly development of law in the natural and in the spiritual world tennyson's message this certainly is a new doctrine in poetry but the message does not end here law implies a source a method an object tennyson after facing his doubts honestly and manfully finds law even in the sorrows and losses of humanity he gives this law an infinite and personal source and finds the supreme purpose of all law to be a revelation of divine love all earthly love therefore becomes an image of the heavenly what first perhaps attracted readers to tennyson as to shakespeare was the character of his women pure gentle refined beings whom we must revere as our anglo-saxon forefathers revered the women they loved like browning the poet had loved one good woman supremely and her love made clear the meaning of all life the message goes one step farther because law and love are in the world faith is the only reasonable attitude toward life and death even though we understand them not such in a few words seems to be tennyson's whole message and philosophy if we attempt now to fix tennyson's permanent place in literature as the result of his life and work we must apply to him the same test that we applied to milton and wordsworth and indeed to all our great poets and ask with the german critics what new thing has he said to the world or even to his own country the answer is frankly that we do not yet know surely that we are still too near tennyson to judge him impersonally this much however is clear in a marvelously complex age and amid a hundred great men he was regarded as a leader for a full half century he was the voice of england loved and honored as a man and a poet not simply by a few discerning critics but by a whole people that do not easily give their allegiance to any one man and that for the present is tennyson's sufficient eulogy end of section fifty two section fifty three of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven continued robert browning eighteen twelve eighteen eighty nine how good is man's life the mere living how fit to employ all the heart and the soul and the senses for ever in joy in this new song of david from browning's saul we have a suggestion of the astonishing vigor and hope that characterize all the works of browning the one poet of the age who after thirty years of continuous work was finally recognized and placed beside tennyson and whom future ages may judge to be a greater poet perhaps even the greatest in our literature since shakespeare the chief difficulty in reading browning is the obscurity of his style which the critics of half a century ago held up to ridicule their attitude toward the poet's early work may be inferred from tennyson's humorous criticism of sordello it may be remembered that the first line of this obscure poem is who will may hear sordello's story told and that the last line is who would has heard sordello's story told tennyson remarked that these were the only lines in the whole poem that he understood and that they were evidently both lies if we attempt to explain this obscurity which puzzled tennyson and many less friendly critics we find that it has many sources first the poet's thought is often obscure or else so extremely subtle that language expresses it imperfectly thoughts hardly to be packed into a narrow act fancies that broke through language and escaped browning's obscurity second 
browning is led from one thing to another by his own mental associations and forgets that the reader's associations may be of an entirely different kind third browning is careless in his english and frequently clips his speech giving us a series of ejaculations as we do not quite understand his process of thought we must stop between the ejaculations to trace out the connections fourth browning's allusions are often far-fetched referring to some odd scrap of information which he has picked up in his wide reading and the ordinary reader finds it difficult to trace and understand them finally browning wrote too much and revised too little the time which he should have given to making one thought clear was used in expressing other thoughts that flitted through his head like a flock of swallows his field was the individual soul never exactly alike in any two men and he sought to express the hidden motives and principles which govern individual action in this field he is like a miner delving underground sending up masses of mingled earth and ore and the reader must sift all this material to separate the gold from the dross here certainly are sufficient reasons for browning's obscurity and we must add the word that the fault seems unpardonable for the simple reason that browning shows himself capable at times of writing directly melodiously and with noble simplicity browning as a teacher so much for the faults which must be faced and overlooked before one finds the treasure that is hidden in browning's poetry of all the poets in our literature no other is so completely so consciously so magnificently a teacher of men he feels his mission of faith and courage in a world of doubt and timidity for thirty years he faced indifference and ridicule working bravely and cheerfully the while until he made the world recognize and follow him the spirit of his whole life is well expressed in his paraclesus written when he was only twenty-two years old i see my way as birds their trackless way i shall arrive what time what circuit first i ask not but unless god send his hail or blinding fireballs sleet or stifling snow in some time his good time i shall arrive he guides me and the bird in his good time he is not like so many others an entertaining poet one cannot read him after dinner or when settled in a comfortable easy chair one must sit up and think and be alert when he reads browning if we accept these conditions we shall probably find that browning is the most stimulating poet in our language his influence upon our life is positive and tremendous his strength his joy of life his robust faith and his invincible optimism enter into us making us different and better men after reading him and perhaps the best thing he can say of browning is that his thought is slowly but surely taking possession of all well-educated men and women life browning's father was outwardly a business man a clerk for fifty years in the bank of england inwardly he was an interesting combination of the scholar and the artist with the best tastes of both his mother was a sensitive musical woman evidently very lovely in character the daughter of a german shipowner and merchant who had settled in scotland she was of celtic descent and carlyle describes her as the true type of a scottish gentlewoman from his neck down browning was the typical briton short stocky large-chested robust but even in the lifeless portrait his face changes as we view it from different angles now it is like an english business man now like a german scientist and now it has a curious suggestion of uncle remus these being no doubt so many different reflections of his mixed and unremembered ancestors he was born in camberwell 
on the outskirts of london in eighteen twelve from his home and from his first school at peckham he could see london and the city lights by night and the smoky chimneys by day had the same powerful fascination for the child that the woods and fields and the beautiful country had for his friend tennyson his schooling was short and desultory his education being attended to by private tutors and by his father who left the boy largely to follow his own inclination like the young milton browning was fond of music and in many of his poems especially in abt vogler and a toccata of galuppi's he interprets the musical temperament better perhaps than any other writer in our literature but unlike milton through whose poetry there runs a great melody music seems to have had no consistent effect upon his verse which is often so jarring that one must wonder how a musical ear could have endured it like tennyson this boy found his work very early and for fifty years hardly a week passed that he did not write poetry he began at six to produce verses in imitation of byron but fortunately this early work has been lost then he fell under the influence of shelley and his first known work pauline eighteen thirty three must be considered as a tribute to shelley and his poetry tennyson's earliest work poems by two brothers had been published and well paid for five years before but browning could find no publisher who would even consider pauline and the work was published by means of money furnished by an indulgent relative this poem received scant notice from the reviewers who had pounced like hawks on a dovecote upon tennyson's first two modest volumes two years later appeared paraclesus and then his tragedy strafford was put upon the stage but not till sordello was published in eighteen forty did he attract attention enough to be denounced for the obscurity and vagaries of his style six years later in eighteen forty six he suddenly became famous not because he finished in that year his bells and pomegranates which is browning's symbolic name for poetry and thought or singing and sermonizing but because he eloped with the best-known literary woman in england elizabeth barrett whose fame was for many years both before and after her marriage much greater than browning's and who was at first considered superior to tennyson thereafter until his own work compelled attention he was known chiefly as the man who married elizabeth barrett for years this lady had been an almost helpless invalid and it seemed a quixotic thing when browning having failed to gain her family's consent to the marriage carried her off romantically love and italy proved better than her physicians and for fifteen years browning and his wife lived an ideally happy life in pisa and in florence the exquisite romance of their love is preserved in mrs browning's sonnets from the portuguese and in the volume of letters recently published wonderful letters but so tender and intimate that it seems almost a sacrilege for inquisitive eyes to read them mrs browning died in florence in eighteen sixty one the loss seemed at first too much to bear and browning fled with his son to england for the remainder of his life he lived alternately in london and in various parts of italy especially at the palazzo rezzonico in venice which is now an object of pilgrimage to almost every tourist who visits the beautiful city wherever he went he mingled with men and women sociable well-dressed courteous loving crowds and popular applause the very reverse of his friend tennyson his earlier work had been much better appreciated in america than in england but with the publication of the ring and the book in eighteen sixty eight he was at last recognized by his countrymen as one of the greatest of english poets he died in venice on december twelfth eighteen eighty nine the same day that saw the publication of his last work Azzolando though italy offered him an honored resting-place england claimed him for her own and he lies buried beside tennyson in westminster abbey 
the spirit of his whole life is magnificently expressed in his own lines in the epilogue of his last book one who never turned his back but marched breast forward never doubted clouds would break never dreamed though right were worsted wrong would triumph held we fall to rise are baffled to fight better sleep to wake works a glance at even the titles which browning gave to his best-known volumes dramatic lyrics eighteen forty two dramatic romances and lyrics eighteen forty five men and women eighteen fifty three dramatis persona eighteen sixty four will suggest how strong the dramatic element is in all his work indeed all his poems may be divided into three classes pure dramas like strafford and a blot in the scutcheon dramatic narratives like pippa passes which are dramatic in form but were not meant to be acted and dramatic lyrics like the last ride together which are short poems expressing some strong personal emotion or describing some dramatic episode in human life and in which the hero himself generally tells the story browning and shakespeare though browning is often compared with shakespeare the reader will understand that he has very little of shakespeare's dramatic talent he cannot bring a group of people together and let the actions and words of his characters show us the comedy and tragedy of human life neither can the author be disinterested satisfied as shakespeare was with life itself without drawing any moral conclusions browning has always a moral ready and insists upon giving us his own views of life which shakespeare never does his dramatic power lies in depicting what he himself calls the history of a soul sometimes as in paraclesus he endeavors to trace the progress of the human spirit more often he takes some dramatic moment in life some crisis in the ceaseless struggle between good and evil and describes with wonderful insight the hero's own thoughts and feelings but he almost invariably tells us how at such and such a point the good or the evil in his hero must inevitably have triumphed and generally as in my last duchess the speaker adds a word here and there aside from the story which unconsciously shows the kind of man he is it is this power of revealing the soul from within that causes browning to fascinate those who study him long enough his range is enormous and brings all sorts and conditions of men under analysis the musician in abt vogler the artist in andrea del sarto the early christian in a death in the desert the arab horseman in muteke the sailor in Erfkil, the medieval knight in child roland the hebrew in saul the greek in balaustion's adventure the monster in caliban the immortal dead in karshish all these and a hundred more histories of the soul show browning's marvellous versatility it is this great range of sympathy with many different types of life that constitutes browning's chief likeness to shakespeare though otherwise there is no comparison between the two men first period of work if we separate all these dramatic poems into three main periods the early from eighteen thirty three to eighteen forty one the middle from eighteen forty one to eighteen sixty eight and the late from eighteen sixty eight to eighteen eighty nine the work of the beginner will be much more easily designated of his early soul studies pauline eighteen thirty three paraclesus eighteen thirty five and sordello eighteen forty little need be said here except perhaps this 
that if we begin with these works we shall probably never read anything else by browning and that were a pity it is better to leave these obscure works until his better poems have so attracted us to browning that we will cheerfully endure his worst faults for the sake of his undoubted virtues the same criticism applies though in less degree to his first drama strafford eighteen thirty seven which belongs to the early period of his work second period the merciless criticism which greeted sordello had a wholesome effect on browning as is shown in the better work of his second period moreover his new power was developing rapidly as may be seen by comparing the eight numbers of his famous bells and pomegranates series eighteen forty one eighteen forty six with his earlier work thus the first number of this wonderful series published in eighteen forty one contains pippa passes which is on the whole the most perfect of his longer poems and another number contains a blot in the scutcheon which is the most readable of his dramas even a beginner must be thrilled by the beauty and the power of these two works two other noteworthy dramas of the period are colomb's birthday eighteen forty four and in a balcony eighteen fifty five which however met with scant appreciation on the stage having too much subtle analysis and too little action to satisfy the public nearly all his best lyrics dramas and dramatic poems belong to this middle period of labor and when the ring and the book appeared in eighteen sixty eight he had given to the world the noblest expression of his poetic genius third period in the third period beginning when browning was nearly sixty years old he wrote even more industriously than before and published on an average nearly a volume of poetry a year such volumes as fifine at the fair red cotton night cap country the inn album jocoseria and many others show how browning gains steadily in the power of revealing the hidden springs of human action but he often rambles most tiresomely and in general his work loses in sustained interest it is perhaps significant that most of his best work was done under mrs browning's influence what to read of the short miscellaneous poems there is such an unusual variety that one must hesitate a little in suggesting this or that to the beginner's attention my star evelyn hope wanting is what home thoughts from abroad meeting at night one word more an exquisite tribute to his dead wife prospice parentheses look forward songs from pippa passes various love poems like by the fireside and the last ride together the inimitable pied piper and the ballads like herve riel and how they brought the good news these are a mere suggestion expressing only the writer's personal preference but a glance at the contents of browning's volumes will reveal scores of other poems which another writer might recommend as being better in themselves or more characteristic of browning note an excellent little book for the beginner is lovett's selections from browning end of note soul studies among browning's dramatic soul studies there is also a very wide choice andrea del sarto is one of the best revealing as it does the strength and the weakness of the perfect painter whose love for a soulless woman with a pretty face saddens his life and hampers his best work next in importance to andrea stands an epistle reciting the experiences of karshish an arab physician which is one of the best examples of browning's peculiar method of presenting the truth the half scoffing half earnest and wholly bewildered state of this oriental scientist's mind is clearly indicated between the lines of his letter to his old master his description of lazarus 
whom he meets by chance and of the state of mind of one who having seen the glories of immortality must live again in the midst of the jumble of trivial and stupendous things which constitute our life forms one of the most original and suggestive poems in our literature my last duchess is a short but very keen analysis of the soul of a selfish man who reveals his character unconsciously by his words of praise concerning his dead wife's picture in the bishop orders his tomb we have another extraordinarily interesting revelation of the mind of a vain and worldly man this time a churchman whose words tell you far more than he dreams about his own character apt fogler undoubtedly one of browning's finest poems is the study of a musician's soul muleke gives us the soul of an arab vain and proud of his fast horse which was never beaten in a race a rival steals the horse and rides away upon her back but used as she is to her master's touch she will not show her best pace to the stranger muleke rides up furiously but instead of striking the thief from his saddle he boasts about his peerless mare saying that if a certain spot on her neck were touched with the rein she could never be overtaken instantly the robber touches the spot and the mare answers with a burst of speed that makes pursuit hopeless muleke has lost his mare but he has kept his pride in the unbeaten one and is satisfied rabbi ben ezra which refuses analysis and which must be read entire to be appreciated is perhaps the most quoted of all browning's works and contains the best expression of his own faith in life both here and hereafter all these wonderful poems are again merely a suggestion they indicate simply the works to which one reader turns when he feels mentally vigorous enough to pick up browning another list of soul studies citing a toccata of galuppi's a grammarian's funeral fra lepolippi saul cleon a death in the desert and soliloquy of the spanish cloister might in another's judgment be more interesting and suggestive pippa passes among browning's longer poems there are two at least which well deserve our study pippa passes aside from its rare poetical qualities is a study of unconscious influence the idea of the poem was suggested to browning while listening to a gypsy girl singing in the woods near his home but he transfers the scene of the action to a little mountain town of azolo in italy pippa is a little silk weaver who goes out in the morning to enjoy her one holiday of the whole year as she thinks of her own happiness she is vaguely wishing that she might share it and do some good then with her childish imagination she begins to weave a little romance in which she shares in the happiness of the four greatest and happiest people in azolo it never occurs to her that perhaps there is more of misery than of happiness in the four great ones of whom she dreams and so she goes on her way singing the years at the spring and days at the morn mornings at seven the hillsides dew pearled the larks on the wing the snails on the thorn god's in his heaven all's right with the world fate wills it that the words and music of her little songs should come to the ears of four different groups of people at the moment when they are facing the greatest crises of their lives and turn the scale from evil to good but pippa knows nothing of this she enjoys her holiday and goes to bed still singing entirely ignorant of the good she has done in the world with one exception it is the most perfect of all browning's works at best it is not easy nor merely entertaining reading but it richly repays whatever hours we spend in studying it the ring and the book the ring and the book is browning's masterpiece it is an immense poem twice as long as paradise lost and longer by some two thousand lines than the iliad 
and before we begin the undoubted task of reading it we must understand that there is no interesting story or dramatic development to carry us along in the beginning we have an outline of the story such as it is a horrible story of count guido's murder of his beautiful young wife and browning tells us in detail just when and how he found a book containing the record of the crime and the trial there the story element ends and the symbolism of the book begins the title of the poem is explained by the habit of the old etruscan goldsmiths who in making one of their elaborately chased rings would mix the pure gold with an alloy in order to harden it when the ring was finished acid was poured upon it and the acid ate out the alloy leaving the beautiful design in pure gold browning purposes to follow the same plan with his literary material which consists simply of the evidence given at the trial of guido in rome in sixteen ninety eight he intends to mix a poet's fancy with the crude facts and create a beautiful and artistic work the result of browning's purpose is a series of monologues in which the same story is retold nine different times by the different actors in the drama the count the young wife the suspected priest the lawyers the pope who presides at the trial each tells the story and each unconsciously reveals the depths of his own nature in the recital the most interesting of the characters are guido the husband who changes from bold defiance to abject fear caponzaki the young priest who aids the wife in her flight from her brutal husband and is unjustly accused of false motives pompilia the young wife one of the noblest characters in literature fit in all respects to rank with shakespeare's great heroines and the pope a splendid figure the strongest of all browning's masculine characters when we have read the story as told by these four different actors we have the best of the poet's work and of the most original poem in our language browning and tennyson browning's place and message browning's place in our literature will be better appreciated by comparison with his friend tennyson whom we have just studied in one respect at least these poets are in perfect accord each finds in love the supreme purpose and meaning of life in other respects especially in their methods of approaching the truth the two men are the exact opposites tennyson is first the artist and then the teacher but with browning the message is always the important thing and he is careless too careless of the form in which it is expressed again tennyson is under the influence of the romantic revival and chooses his subjects daintily but all's fish that comes to browning's net he takes comely and ugly subjects with equal pleasure and aims to show that truth lies hidden in both the evil and the good this contrast is all the more striking when we remember that browning's essentially scientific attitude was taken by a man who refused to study science tennyson whose work is always artistic never studied art but was devoted to the sciences while browning whose work is seldom artistic in form thought that art was the most suitable subject for man's study browning's message the two poets differ even more widely in their respective messages tennyson's message reflects the growing order of the age and is summed up in the word law in his view the individual will must be suppressed the self must always be subordinate his resignation is at times almost oriental in its fatalism and occasionally it suggests schopenhauer in its mixture of fate and pessimism browning's message on the other hand is the triumph of the individual will over all obstacles the self is not subordinate but supreme there is nothing oriental nothing doubtful nothing pessimistic in the whole range of his poetry his is the voice of the anglo-saxon standing up in the face of all obstacles and saying i can and i will 
he is therefore far more radically english than is tennyson and it may be for this reason that he is the more studied and that while youth delights in tennyson manhood is better satisfied with browning because of his invincible will and optimism browning is at present regarded as the poet who has spoken the strongest word of faith to an age of doubt his energy his cheerful courage his faith in life and in the development that awaits us beyond the portals of death are like a bugle call to good living this sums up his present influence upon the minds of those who have learned to appreciate him of the future we can only say that both at home and abroad he seems to be gaining steadily in appreciation as the years go by end of section fifty three Section 54 of English Literature by William J. Long. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 continued. Minor Poets of the Victorian Age. Elizabeth Barrett. Among the minor poets of the past century, Elizabeth Barrett, Mrs. Browning, occupies perhaps the highest place in popular favor. She was born at Coxhoe Hall near Durham in 1806, but her childhood and early youth were spent in Herefordshire among the Malvern Hills made famous by Piers Plowman in eighteen thirty five the barrett family moved to london where elizabeth gained a literary reputation by the publication of the seraphim and other poems eighteen thirty eight then illness and the shock caused by the tragic death of her brother in eighteen forty placed her frail life in danger and for six years she was confined to her own room the innate strength and beauty of her spirit here showed itself strongly in her daily study her poetry and especially in her interest in the social problems which sooner or later occupied all the victorian writers my mind to me a kingdom is might well have been written over the door of the room where this delicate invalid worked and suffered in loneliness and in silence in eighteen forty four miss barrett published her poems which though somewhat impulsive and overwrought met with remarkable public favor such poems as the cry of the children which voices the protest of humanity against child labor appealed tremendously to the readers of the age and this young woman's fame as a poet temporarily overshadowed that of tennyson and browning indeed as late as eighteen fifty when wordsworth died she was seriously considered for the position of poet laureate which was finally given to tennyson a reference to browning in lady geraldine's courtship is supposed to have first led the poet to write to miss barrett in eighteen forty five soon afterwards he visited the invalid they fell in love almost at first sight and the following year against the wishes of her father who was evidently a selfish old tyrant browning carried her off and married her the exquisite romance of their love is reflected in mrs browning's sonnets from the portuguese eighteen fifty this is a noble and inspiring book of love poems and stedman regards the opening sonnet i thought once how theocritus had sung as equal to any in our language for fifteen years the brownings lived an ideally happy life at pisa and at casaguidi florence sharing the same poetical ambitions and love was the greatest thing in the world how do i love thee let me count the ways i love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace i love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight i love thee freely as men strive for right i love thee purely as they turn from praise i love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith i love thee with a love i seemed to lose with my lost saints 
i love thee with the breath smiles tears of all my life and if god choose i shall but love thee better after death mrs browning entered with whole-souled enthusiasm into the aspirations of italy in its struggle against the tyranny of austria and her casa guidi windows eighteen fifty one is a combination of poetry and politics both it must be confessed a little too emotional in eighteen fifty six she published aurora ley a novel in verse having for its hero a young social reformer and for its heroine a young woman poetical and enthusiastic who strongly suggests elizabeth barrett herself it emphasizes in verse precisely the same moral and social ideals which dickens and george eliot were proclaiming in all their novels her last two volumes were poems before congress eighteen sixty and last poems published after her death she died suddenly in eighteen sixty one and was buried in florence browning's famous line o lyric love half angel and half bird may well apply to her frail life and aerial spirit rossetti dante gabriel rossetti eighteen twenty eight eighteen eighty two the son of an exiled italian painter and scholar was distinguished both as a painter and as a poet he was a leader of the pre-raphaelite movement note this term which means simply italian painters before raphael is generally applied to an artistic movement in the middle of the nineteenth century the term was first used by a brotherhood of german artists who worked together in the convent of san isodoro in rome with the idea of restoring art to its medieval purity and simplicity the term now generally refers to a company of seven young men dante gabriel rossetti and his brother william william holman hunt john everett millay james collinson frederick george stevens and thomas woolner who formed the pre-raphaelite brotherhood in england in eighteen forty eight their official literary organ was called the germ in which much of the early work of morris and rossetti appeared they took for their models the early italian painters who they declared were simple sincere and religious their purpose was to encourage simplicity and naturalness in art and literature and one of their chief objects in the face of doubt and materialism was to express the wonder reverence and awe which characterizes medieval art in its return to the mysticism and symbolism of the medieval age this pre-raphaelitism suggests the contemporary oxford or tractarian movement in religion End of note and published in the first numbers of the germ his hand and soul a delicate prose study and his famous the blessed damozel beginning the blessed damozel leaned out from the gold bar of heaven her eyes were deeper than the depth of waters stilled at even she had three lilies in her hand and the stars in her hair were seven these two early works especially the blessed damozel with its simplicity and exquisite spiritual quality are characteristic of the ideals of the pre-raphaelites in eighteen sixty after a long engagement rossetti married elizabeth siddle a delicate beautiful english girl whom he has immortalized both in his pictures and in his poetry she died two years later and rossetti never entirely recovered from the shock at her burial he placed in her coffin the manuscripts of all his unpublished poems and only at the persistent demands of his friends did he allow them to be exhumed and printed in eighteen seventy the publication of his volume of love poems created a sensation in literary circles and rossetti was hailed as one of the greatest of living poets in eighteen eighty one he published his ballads and sonnets a remarkable volume containing among other poems the confession modelled after browning 
the ballad of sister helen founded on a medieval superstition the king's tragedy a masterpiece of dramatic narrative and the house of life a collection of one hundred and one sonnets reflecting the poet's love and loss this last collection deserves to rank with mrs browning's sonnets from the portuguese and with shakespeare's sonnets as one of the three great cycles of love poems in our language it has been well said that both rossetti and morris paint pictures as well in their poems as on their canvases and this pictorial quality of their verse is its chief characteristic morris william morris eighteen thirty four eighteen ninety six is a most interesting combination of literary man and artist in the latter capacity as architect designer and manufacturer of furniture carpets and wall paper and as founder of the kelmscott press for artistic printing and bookbinding he has laid us all under an immense debt of gratitude from boyhood he had steeped himself in the legends and ideals of the middle ages and his best literary work is wholly medieval in spirit the earthly paradise eighteen sixty eight eighteen seventy is generally regarded as his masterpiece this delightful collection of stories in verse tells of a roving band of vikings who are wrecked on the fabled island of atlantis and who discover there a superior race of men having the characteristics of ideal greeks the vikings remain for a year telling stories of their own northland and listening to the classic and oriental tales of their hosts morris's interest in icelandic literature is further shown by his sigurd the volsung an epic founded upon one of the old sagas and by his prose romances the house of the wolfings the story of the glittering plain and the roots of the mountains later in life he became deeply interested in socialism and two other romances the dream of john ball and news from nowhere are interesting as modern attempts at depicting an ideal society governed by the principles of moore's utopia swinburne algernon charles swinburne eighteen thirty seven nineteen o nine is chronologically the last of the victorian poets as an artist in technique having perfect command of all old english verse forms and a remarkable faculty for inventing new he seems at the present time to rank among the best in our literature indeed as stedman says before his advent we did not realize the full scope of english verse this refers to the melodious and constantly changing form rather than to the content of swinburne's poetry at the death of tennyson in eighteen ninety two he was undoubtedly the greatest living poet and only his liberal opinions his scorn of royalty and of conventions and the prejudice aroused by the pagan spirit of his early work prevented his appointment as poet laureate he has written a very large number of poems dramas and essays in literary criticism but we are still too near to judge of the permanence of his work or of his place in literature those who would read and estimate his work for themselves will do well to begin with a volume of selected poems especially those which show his love of the sea and his exquisite appreciation of child life his atalanta in caledon eighteen sixty four a beautiful lyric drama modeled on the greek tragedy is generally regarded as his masterpiece in all his work swinburne carries tennyson's love of melody to an extreme and often sacrifices sense to sound his poetry is always musical and like music appeals almost exclusively to the emotions we have chosen somewhat arbitrarily these four writers mrs browning d g rossetti morris and swinburne as representative of the minor poets of the age but there are many others who are worthy of study arthur hugh clough eighteen 
and matthew arnold note arnold was one of the best-known poets of the age but because he has exerted a deeper influence in our literature as a critic we have reserved him for special study among the essayists End of note who are often called the poets of skepticism but who in reality represent a reverent seeking for truth through reason and human experience frederick william faber the catholic mystic author of some exquisite hymns and the scholarly john keble author of the christian year our best-known book of devotional verse and among the women poets adelaide proctor jean Inglo, and christina rossetti each of whom had a large admiring circle of readers it would be a hopeless task at the present time to inquire into the relative merits of all these minor poets we note only their careful workmanship and exquisite melody their wide range of thought and feeling their eager search for truth each in his own way and especially the note of freshness and vitality which they have given to english poetry End of section fifty four Section 55 of English Literature by William J. Long. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 continued. Part 2 The Novelists of the Victorian Age. Charles Dickens, 1812 1870. When we consider Dickens' life and work in comparison with that of the two great poets we have been studying, the contrast is startling while tennyson and browning were being educated for the life of literature and shielded most tenderly from the hardships of the world dickens a poor obscure and suffering child was helping to support a shiftless family by pasting labels on blacking bottles sleeping under a counter like a homeless cat and once a week timidly approaching the big prison where his father was confined for debt in eighteen thirty six his pickwick was published and life was changed as if a magician had waved his wand over him while the two great poets were slowly struggling for recognition dickens with plenty of money and too much fame was the acknowledged literary hero of england the idol of immense audiences which gathered to applaud him wherever he appeared and there is also this striking contrast between the novelist and the poets that while the whole tendency of the age was toward realism away from the extremes of the romanticists and from the oddities and absurdities of the early novel writers it was precisely by emphasizing oddities and absurdities by making caricatures rather than characters that dickens first achieved his popularity life in dickens early life we see a stern but unrecognized preparation for the work that he was to do never was there a better illustration of the fact that a boy's early hardship and suffering are sometimes only divine messengers disguised and that circumstances which seem only evil are often the source of a man's strength and of the influence which he is to wield in the world he was the second of eight poor children and was born at landport in eighteen twelve his father who is supposed to be the original of mr micawber was a clerk in a navy office he could never make both ends meet and after struggling with debts in his native town for many years moved to london when dickens was nine years old the debts still pursued him and after two years of grandiloquent misfortune he was thrown into the poor debtor's prison his wife the original of mrs micawber then set up the famous boarding establishment for young ladies but in dickens words no young ladies ever came the only visitors were creditors and they were quite ferocious in the picture of the micawber family with its tears and smiles and general shiftlessness we have a suggestion of dickens own family life at eleven years of age the boy was taken out of school and went to work in the cellar of a blacking factory 
at this time he was in his own words a queer small boy who suffered as he worked and we can appreciate the boy and the suffering more when we find both reflected in the character of david copperfield it is a heart-rending picture this sensitive child working from dawn till dark for a few pennies and associating with tufts and waifs in his brief intervals of labor but we can see in it the sources of that intimate knowledge of the hearts of the poor and outcast which was soon to be reflected in literature and to startle all england by its appeal for sympathy a small legacy ended this wretchedness bringing the father from the prison and sending the boy to wellington house academy a worthless and brutal school evidently whose headmaster was in dickens's words a most ignorant fellow and a tyrant he learned little at this place being interested chiefly in stories and in acting out the heroic parts which appealed to his imagination but again his personal experience was of immense value and resulted in his famous picture of dotheboys hall in nicholas nickleby which helped largely to mitigate the evils of private schools in england wherever he went dickens was a marvelously keen observer with an active imagination which made stories out of incidents and characters that ordinary men would have hardly noticed moreover he was a born actor and was at one time the leading spirit of a band of amateurs who gave entertainments for charity all over england these three things his keen observation his active imagination and the actor's spirit which animated him furnish a key to his life and writings when only fifteen years old he left the school and again went to work this time as a clerk in a lawyer's office by night he studied shorthand in order to fit himself to be a reporter this in imitation of his father who was now engaged by a newspaper to report the speeches in parliament everything that dickens attempted seems to have been done with vigor and intensity and within two years we find him reporting important speeches and writing out his notes as the heavy coach lurched and rolled through the mud of country roads on its dark way to london town it was largely during this period that he gained his extraordinary knowledge of inns and stables and horsey persons which is reflected in his novels he also grew ambitious and began to write on his own account at the age of twenty-one he dropped his first little sketch stealthily with fear and trembling into a dark letter-box in a dark office up a dark court in fleet street the name of this first sketch was mr minns and his cousin and it appeared with other stories in his first book sketches by boz in eighteen thirty five one who reads these sketches now with their intimate knowledge of the hidden life of london can understand dickens's first newspaper success perfectly his best-known work pickwick was published serially in eighteen thirty six to eighteen thirty seven and dickens's fame and fortune were made never before had a novel appeared so full of vitality and merriment though crude in design a mere jumble of exaggerated characters and incidents it fairly bubbled over with the kind of humor in which the british public delights and it still remains after three quarters of a century one of our most care dispelling books the remainder of dickens's life is largely a record of personal triumphs pickwick was followed rapidly by oliver twist nicholas nickleby old curiosity shop and by many other works which seem to indicate that there was no limit to the new author's invention of odd grotesque uproarious and sentimental characters in the intervals of his novel writing he attempted several times to edit a weekly paper but his power lay in other directions and with the exception of household words his journalistic ventures were not a marked success again the actor came to the surface and after managing a company of amateur actors successfully dickens began to give dramatic readings from his own works 
as he was already the most popular writer in the english language these readings were very successful crowds thronged to hear him and his journeys became a continuous ovation money poured into his pockets from his novels and from his readings and he bought for himself a home gadshill place which he had always desired and which is forever associated with his memory though he spent the greater part of his time and strength in travel at this period nothing is more characteristic of the man than the intense energy with which he turned from his lecturing to his novels and then for relaxation gave himself up to what he called the magic lantern of the london streets in eighteen forty two while still a young man dickens was invited to visit the united states and canada where his works were even better known than in england and where he was received as the guest of the nation and treated with every mark of honor and appreciation at this time america was to most europeans a kind of huge fairyland where money sprang out of the earth and life was happy as a long holiday dickens evidently shared this rosy view and his romantic expectations were naturally disappointed the crude unfinished look of the big country seems to have roused a strong prejudice in his mind which was not overcome at the time of his second visit twenty-five years later and which brought forth the harsh criticism of his american notes eighteen forty two and of martin chuzzlewit eighteen forty three to eighteen forty four these two unkind books struck a false note and dickens began to lose something of his great popularity in addition he had spent money beyond his income his domestic life which had been at first very happy became more and more irritating until he separated from his wife in eighteen fifty eight to get inspiration which seemed for a time to have failed he journeyed to italy but was disappointed then he turned back to the london streets and in five years from eighteen forty eight to eighteen fifty three appeared dombey and son david copperfield and bleak house three remarkable novels which indicate that he had rediscovered his own power and genius later he resumed the public readings with their public triumph and applause which soon came to be a necessity to one who craved popularity as a hungry man craves bread these excitements exhausted dickens physically and spiritually and death was the inevitable result he died in eighteen seventy over his unfinished edwin drood and was buried in westminster abbey dickens work in view of his life a glance through even this unsatisfactory biography gives us certain illuminating suggestions in regard to all of dickens work first as a child poor and lonely longing for love and for society he laid the foundation for those heart-rending pictures of children which have moved so many readers to unaccustomed tears second as clerk in a lawyer's office and in the courts he gained his knowledge of an entirely different side of human life here he learned to understand both the enemies and the victims of society between whom the harsh laws of that day frequently made no distinction third as a reporter and afterwards as manager of various newspapers he learned the trick of racy writing and of knowing to a nicety what would suit the popular taste fourth as an actor always an actor in spirit he seized upon every dramatic possibility every tense situation every peculiarity of voice and gesture in the people whom he met and reproduced these things in his novels exaggerating them in the way that most pleased his audience when we turn from his outward training to his inner disposition we find two strongly marked elements the first is his excessive imagination which made good stories out of incidents that ordinarily pass unnoticed and which described the commonest things a street a shop a fog a lamp-post a stage-coach with a wealth of detail and of romantic suggestion that makes many of his descriptions like lyric poems 
the second element is his extreme sensibility which finds relief only in laughter and tears like shadow and sunshine these follow one another closely throughout all his books dickens and his public remembering these two things his training and disposition we can easily foresee the kind of novel he must produce he will be sentimental especially over children and outcasts he will excuse the individual in view of the faults of society he will be dramatic or melodramatic and his sensibility will keep him always close to the public studying its tastes and playing with its smiles and tears if pleasing the public be in itself an art then dickens is one of our greatest artists and it is well to remember that in pleasing his public there was nothing of the hypocrite or demagogue in his make-up he was essentially a part of the great drifting panoramic crowd that he loved his sympathetic soul made all their joys and griefs his own he fought against injustice he championed the weak against the strong he gave courage to the faint and hope to the weary in heart and in the love which the public gave him in return he found his best reward here is the secret of dickens unprecedented popular success and we may note here a very significant parallel with shakespeare the great difference in the genius and work of the two men does not change the fact that each won success largely because he studied and pleased his public general plan of dickens novels an interesting suggestion comes to us from a study of the conditions which led to dickens first three novels pickwick was written at the suggestion of an editor for serial publication each chapter was to be accompanied by a cartoon by seymour a comic artist of the day and the object was to amuse the public and incidentally to sell the paper the result was a series of characters and scenes and incidents which for vigor and boundless fun have never been equaled in our language thereafter no matter what he wrote dickens was labeled a humorist like a certain american writer of our own generation everything he said whether for a feast or a funeral was supposed to contain a laugh in a word he was the victim of his own book dickens was keen enough to understand his danger and his next novel oliver twist had the serious purpose of mitigating the evils under which the poor were suffering its hero was a poor child an unfortunate victim of society and in order to draw attention to the real need dickens exaggerated the woeful condition of the poor and filled his pages with sentiment which easily slipped over into sentimentality this also was a popular success and in his third novel nicholas nickleby and indeed in most of his remaining works dickens combined the principles of his first two books giving us mirth on the one hand injustice and suffering on the other mingling humor and pathos tears and laughter as we find them in life itself and in order to increase the lights and shadows in his scenes and to give greater dramatic effect to his narrative he introduced odious and loathsome characters and made vice more hateful by contrasting it with innocence and virtue his characters we find therefore in most of dickens novels three or four widely different types of character first the innocent little child like oliver joe paul tiny tim and little nell appealing powerfully to the child love in every human heart second the horrible or grotesque foil like skears fagin quilp uriah heep and bill sykes third the grandiloquent or broadly humorous fellow the fun-maker like micawber and sam weller and fourth a tenderly or powerfully drawn figure like lady dedlock of bleak house and sidney carton of a tale of two cities which rise to the dignity of true characters we note also that most of dickens novels belong decidedly to the class of purpose or problem novels thus bleak house attacks the law's delays little dorrit the injustice which persecutes poor debtors 
nicholas nickleby the abuses of charity schools and brutal schoolmasters and oliver twist the unnecessary degradation and suffering of the poor in english workhouses dickens serious purpose was to make the novel the instrument of morality and justice and whatever we may think of the exaggeration of his characters it is certain that his stories did more to correct the general selfishness and injustice of society toward the poor than all the works of other literary men of his age combined the limitations of dickens any severe criticism of dickens as a novelist must seem at first glance unkind and unnecessary in almost every house he is a welcome guest a personal friend who has beguiled many an hour with his stories and who has furnished us much good laughter and a few good tears moreover he has always a cheery message he emphasizes the fact that this is an excellent world that some errors have crept into it due largely to thoughtlessness but that they can be easily remedied by a little human sympathy that is a most welcome creed to an age overburdened with social problems and to criticize our cheery companion seems as discourteous as to speak unkindly of a guest who has just left our home but we must consider dickens not merely as a friend but as a novelist and apply to his work the same standards of art which we apply to other writers and when we do this we are sometimes a little disappointed we must confess that his novels while they contain many realistic details seldom give the impression of reality his characters though we laugh or weep or shudder at them are sometimes only caricatures each one an exaggeration of some peculiarity which suggest ben jonson's every man in his humor it is dickens art to give his heroes sufficient reality to make them suggest certain types of men and women whom we know but in reading him we find ourselves often in the mental state of a man who is watching through a microscope the swarming life of a water drop here are lively bustling extraordinary creatures some beautiful some grotesque but all far apart from the life that we know in daily experience it is certainly not the reality of these characters but rather the genius of the author in managing them which interests us and holds our attention notwithstanding this criticism which we would gladly have omitted dickens is excellent reading and his novels will continue to be popular just so long as men enjoy a wholesome and absorbing story what to read aside from the reforms in schools and prisons and workhouses which dickens accomplished he has laid us all rich and poor alike under a debt of gratitude after the year eighteen forty three the one literary work which he never neglected was to furnish a christmas story for his readers and it is due in some measure to the help of these stories brimming over with good cheer that christmas has become in all english-speaking countries a season of gladness of gift-giving at home and of remembering those less fortunate than ourselves who are still members of a common brotherhood if we read nothing else of dickens once a year at christmas time we should remember him and renew our youth by reading one of his holiday stories the cricket on the hearth the chimes and above all the unrivalled christmas carol the latter especially will be read and loved for as long as men are moved by the spirit of christmas tale of two cities of the novels david copperfield is regarded by many as dickens masterpiece it is well to begin with this novel not simply for unusual interest of the story but also for the glimpse it gives us of the author's own boyhood and family for pure fun and hilarity pickwick will always be a favorite but for artistic finish and for the portrayal of one great character sidney carton nothing else that dickens wrote is comparable to a tale of two cities here is an absorbing story with a carefully constructed plot and the action moves swiftly to its thrilling inevitable conclusion 
usually dickens introduces several pathetic or grotesque or laughable characters besides the main actors and records various unnecessary dramatic episodes for their own sake but in a tale of two cities everything has its place in the development of the main story there are as usual many characters sidney carton the outcast who lays down his life for the happiness of one whom he loves charles darnay an exiled young french noble dr manette who has been recalled to life from a frightful imprisonment and his gentle daughter lucy the heroine jarvis lorry a lovable old-fashioned clerk in the big banking-house the terrible madame de farge knitting calmly at the door of her wine-shop and recording with the ferocity of a tiger licking its chops the names of all those who are marked for vengeance and a dozen others each well drawn who play minor parts in the tragedy the scene is laid in london and paris at the time of the french revolution and though careless of historical details dickens reproduces the spirit of the reign of terror so well that a tale of two cities is an excellent supplement to the history of the period it is written in dickens usual picturesque style and reveals his usual imaginative outlook on life and his fondness for fine sentiments and dramatic episodes indeed all his qualities are here shown not brilliantly or garishly as in other novels but subdued and softened like a shaded light for artistic effect those who are interested in dickens growth and methods can hardly do better than to read in succession his first three novels pickwick oliver twist and nicholas nickleby which as we have indicated show clearly how he passed from fun to serious purpose and which furnish in combination the general plan of all his later works for the rest we can only indicate those which in our personal judgment seem best worth reading bleak house dombey and son our mutual friend and old curiosity shop but we are not yet far enough away from the first popular success of these works to determine their permanent value and influence End of section 55section fifty six of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven continued william makepeace thackeray eighteen eleven eighteen sixty three as the two most successful novelists of their day it is natural for us as it was for their personal friends and admirers to compare dickens and thackeray with respect to their life and work and their attitude toward the world in which they lived dickens after a desperately hard struggle in his boyhood without friends or higher education comes into manhood cheery self-confident energetic filled with the joy of his work and in the world which had at first treated him so harshly he finds good everywhere even in the jails and in the slums simply because he is looking for it thackeray after a boyhood spent in the best of english schools with money friends and comforts of every kind faces life timidly distrustfully and dislikes the literary work which makes him famous he has a gracious and lovable personality is kind of heart and reveres all that is pure and good in life yet he is almost cynical towards the world which uses him so well and finds shams deceptions vanities everywhere because he looks for them one finds what one seeks in this world but it is perhaps significant that dickens sought his golden fleece among plain people and thackeray in high society the chief difference between the two novelists however is not one of environment but of temperament put thackeray in a workhouse and he will still find material for another book of snobs put dickens in society and he cannot help finding undreamed-of possibilities among bewigged and bepowdered high lords and ladies for dickens is romantic and emotional 
and interprets the world largely through his imagination thackeray is the realist and moralist who judges solely by observation and reflection he aims to give us a true picture of the society of his day and as he finds it pervaded by intrigues and snobbery he proceeds to satirize it and point out its moral evils in his novels he is influenced by swift and fielding but he is entirely free from the bitterness of the one and the coarseness of the other and his satire is generally softened by a noble tenderness taken together the novels of dickens and thackeray give us a remarkable picture of all classes of english society in the middle of the nineteenth century life thackeray was born in eighteen eleven in calcutta where his father held a civil position under the indian government when the boy was five years old his father died and the mother returned with her child to england presently she married again and thackeray was sent to the famous charterhouse school of which he has given us a vivid picture in the newcomes such a school would have been a veritable heaven to dickens who at this time was tossed about between poverty and ambition but thackeray detested it for its rude manners and occasionally referred to it as the slaughterhouse writing to his mother he says there are three hundred and seventy boys in the school i wish there were only three hundred and sixty-nine in eighteen twenty nine thackeray entered trinity college cambridge but left it after less than two years without taking a degree and went to germany and france where he studied with the idea of becoming an artist when he became of age in eighteen thirty two he came into possession of a comfortable fortune returned to england and settled down in the temple to study law soon he began to dislike the profession intensely and we have in pendennis a reflection of his mental attitude toward the law and the young men who studied it he soon lost his fortune partly by gambling and speculation partly by unsuccessful attempts at running a newspaper and at twenty-two began for the first time to earn his own living as an artist and illustrator an interesting meeting between thackeray and dickens at this time eighteen thirty six suggests the relative importance of the two writers seymour who was illustrating the pickwick papers had just died and thackeray called upon dickens with a few drawings and asked to be allowed to continue the illustrations dickens was at this time at the beginning of his great popularity the better literary artist whose drawings were refused was almost unknown and had to work hard for more than ten years before he received recognition disappointed by his failure as an illustrator he began his literary career by writing satires on society for fraser's magazine this was the beginning of his success but though the yellow plush papers the great hoggarty diamond catherine the fitz boodlers the book of snobs barry lyndon and various other immature works made him known to a few readers of punch and of fraser's magazine it was not till the publication of vanity fair eighteen forty seven to eighteen forty eight that he began to be recognized as one of the great novelists of his day all his earlier works are satires some upon society others upon the popular novelists bulwer disraeli and especially dickens with whose sentimental heroes and heroines he had no patience whatever he had married meanwhile in eighteen thirty six and for a few years was very happy in his home then disease and insanity fastened upon his young wife and she was placed in an asylum the whole afterlife of our novelist was darkened by this loss worse than death he became a man of the clubs rather than of his own home and though his wit and kindness made him the most welcome of club men there was an undercurrent of sadness in all that he wrote long afterwards he said that though his marriage ended in shipwreck he would do it over again for behold love is the crown and completion of all earthly good after the moderate success of vanity fair thackeray wrote the three novels of his middle life upon which his fame chiefly rests 
pendennis in 1850 henry esmond in 1852 and the newcomes in 1855 dickens's great popular success as a lecturer and dramatic reader had led to a general desire on the part of the public to see and to hear literary men and thackeray to increase his income gave two remarkable courses of lectures the first being english humorists of the eighteenth century and the second the four georges both courses being delivered with gratifying success in england and especially in america dickens as we have seen was disappointed in america and vented his displeasure in outrageous criticism but thackeray with his usual good breeding saw only the best side of his generous entertainers and in both his public and private utterances emphasized the virtues of the new land whose restless energy seemed to fascinate him unlike dickens he had no confidence in himself when he faced an audience and like most literary men he disliked lecturing and soon gave it up in eighteen sixty he became editor of the cornhill magazine which prospered in his hands and with a comfortable income he seemed just ready to do his best work for the world which has always believed that he was capable of even better things than he ever wrote when he died suddenly in eighteen sixty three his body lies buried in kensal green and only a bust does honor to his memory in westminster abbey henry esmond works of thackeray the beginner will do well to omit the earlier satires of thackeray written while he was struggling to earn a living from the magazines and open henry esmond eighteen fifty two his most perfect novel though not the most widely known and read the fine historical and literary flavor of this story is one of its most marked characteristics and only one who knows something of the history and literature of the eighteenth century can appreciate its value the hero colonel esmond relates his own story carrying the reader through the courts and camps of queen anne's reign and giving the most complete and accurate picture of a past age that has ever appeared in a novel thackeray is as we have said a realist and he begins his story by adopting the style and manner of a scholarly gentleman of the period he is describing he has an extraordinary knowledge of eighteenth century literature and he reproduces its style in detail going so far as to insert in his narrative an alleged essay from the tatler and so perfectly is it done that it is impossible to say wherein it differs from the style of addison and steele realism of esmond in his matter also thackeray is realistic reflecting not the pride and pomp of war which are largely delusions but its brutality and barbarism which are all too real painting generals and leaders not as the newspaper heroes to whom we are accustomed but as moved by intrigues petty jealousies and selfish ambitions showing us the great duke of marlborough not as the military hero the idol of war crazed multitudes but as without personal honor and governed by despicable avarice in a word thackeray gives us the back stairs view of war which is as a rule totally neglected in our histories when he deals with the literary men of the period he uses the same frank realism showing us steele and addison and other leaders not with halos about their heads as popular authors but in slippers and dressing-gowns smoking a pipe in their own rooms or else growing tipsy and hilarious in the taverns just as they appeared in daily life both in style and in matter therefore esmond deserves to rank as probably the best historical novel in our language the plot of esmond the plot of the story is like most of thackeray's plots very slight but perfectly suited to the novelist's purpose the plans of his characters fail their ideals grow dim there is a general disappearance of youthful ambitions there is a love story at the centre but the element of romance which furnishes the light and music and fragrance of love is inconspicuous 
the hero after ten years of devotion to a young woman a paragon of beauty finally marries her mother and ends with a few pious observations concerning heaven's mercy and his own happy lot such an ending seems disappointing almost bizarre in view of the romantic novels to which we are accustomed but we must remember that thackeray's purpose was to paint life as he saw it and that in life men and things often take a different way from that described in romances as we grow acquainted with thackeray's characters we realize that no other ending was possible to his story and conclude that his plot like his style is perhaps as near perfection as a realistic novelist can ever come vanity fair vanity fair eighteen forty seven eighteen forty eight is the best known of thackeray's novels it was his first great work and was intended to express his own views of the social life about him and to protest against the overdrawn heroes of popular novels he takes for his subject that vanity fair to which christian and faithful were conducted on their way to the heavenly city as recorded in pilgrim's progress in this fair there are many different booths given over to the sale of all sorts of vanities and as we go from one to another we come in contact with juggling cheats games plays fools apes knaves rogues and that of every kind evidently this is a picture of one side of social life but the difference between bunyan and thackeray is simply this that bunyan made vanity fair a small incident in a long journey a place through which most of us pass on our way to better things while thackeray describing high society in his own day makes it a place of long sojourn wherein his characters spend the greater part of their lives thackeray styles this work a novel without a hero the whole action of the story which is without plot or development revolves about two women amelia a meek creature of the milk and water type and becky sharp a keen unprincipled intriguer who lets nothing stand in the way of her selfish desire to get the most out of the fools who largely constitute society on the whole it is the most powerful but not the most wholesome of thackeray's works pendennis in his second important novel pendennis eighteen forty nine eighteen fifty we have a continuation of the satire on society begun in vanity fair this novel which the beginner should read after esmond is interesting to us for two reasons because it reflects more of the details of thackeray's life than all his other writings and because it contains one powerfully drawn character who is a perpetual reminder of the danger of selfishness the hero is neither angel nor imp in thackeray's words but the typical young man of society whom he knows thoroughly and whom he paints exactly as he is a careless good-natured but essentially selfish person who goes through life intent on his own interests pendennis is a profound moral study and the most powerful arraignment of well-meaning selfishness in our literature not even excepting george eliot's romola which it suggests the newcomes two other novels the newcomes eighteen fifty five and the virginians eighteen fifty nine complete the list of thackeray's great works of fiction the former is a sequel to pendennis and the latter to henry esmond and both share the general fate of sequels in not being quite equal in power or interest to their predecessors the newcomes however deserves a very high place some critics indeed placing it at the head of the author's works like all thackeray's novels it is a story of human frailty but here the author's innate gentleness and kindness are seen at their best and the hero is perhaps the most genuine and lovable of all his characters thackeray's essays thackeray is known in english literature as an essayist as well as a novelist his english humorists and the four georges are among the finest essays of the nineteenth century in the former especially thackeray shows not only a wide knowledge but an extraordinary understanding of his subject 
apparently this nineteenth century writer knows addison fielding swift smollett and other great writers of the past century almost as intimately as one knows his nearest friend and he gives us the fine flavor of their humor in a way which no other writer save perhaps lamb has ever rivaled note it should be pointed out that the english humorists is somewhat too highly colored to be strictly accurate in certain cases also notably that of steele the reader may well object to thackeray's patronizing attitude toward his subject End of note the four georges is in a vein of delicate satire and presents a rather unflattering picture of four of england's rulers and of the courts in which they moved both these works are remarkable for their exquisite style their gentle humor their keen literary criticisms and for the intimate knowledge and sympathy which makes the people of a past age live once more in the written pages general characteristics in treating of thackeray's view of life as reflected in his novels critics vary greatly and the following summary must be taken not as a positive judgment but only as an attempt to express the general impression of his works on an uncritical reader he is first of all a realist who paints life as he sees it as he says himself i have no brains above my eyes i describe what i see his pictures of certain types notably the weak and vicious elements of society are accurate and true to life but they seem to play too large a part in his books and have perhaps too greatly influenced his general judgment of humanity an excessive sensibility or the capacity for fine feelings and emotions is a marked characteristic of thackeray as it is of dickens and carlyle he is easily offended as they are by the shams of society but he cannot find an outlet as dickens does in laughter and tears and he is too gentle to follow carlyle in violent denunciations and prophecies he turns to satire influenced doubtless by eighteenth-century literature which he knew so well and in which satire played too large a part his satire is never personal like pope's or brutal like swift's it is tempered by kindness and humor but it is used too freely and generally lays too much emphasis on faults and foibles to be considered a true picture of any large class of english society thackeray is a moralist besides being a realist and satirist thackeray is essentially a moralist like addison aiming definitely in all his work at producing a moral impression so much does he revere goodness and so determined is he that his pendennis or his becky sharp shall be judged at their true value that he is not content like shakespeare to be simply an artist to tell an artistic tale and let it speak its own message he must explain and emphasize the moral significance of his work there is no need to consult our own conscience over the actions of thackeray's characters the beauty of virtue and the ugliness of vice are evident on every page his style whatever we may think of thackeray's matter there is one point in which critics are agreed that he is master of a pure and simple english style whether his thought be sad or humorous commonplace or profound he expresses it perfectly without effort or affectation in all his work there is a subtle charm impossible to describe which gives the impression that we are listening to a gentleman and it is the ease the refinement the exquisite naturalness of thackeray's style that furnishes a large part of our pleasure in reading him End of section fifty six section fifty seven of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven continued mary ann evans george eliot eighteen nineteen eighteen eighty in nearly all the writers of the victorian age we note on the one hand a strong intellectual tendency to analyze the problems of life and on the other a tendency to teach that is to explain to men the method by which these problems may be solved 
the novels especially seem to lose sight of the purely artistic ideal of writing and to aim definitely at moral instruction in george eliot both these tendencies reach a climax she is more obviously more consciously a preacher and moralizer than any of her great contemporaries though profoundly religious at heart she was largely occupied by the scientific spirit of the age and finding no religious creed or political system satisfactory she fell back upon duty as the supreme law of life all her novels aim first to show in individuals the play of universal moral forces and second to establish the moral law as the basis of human society aside from this moral teaching we look to george eliot for the reflection of country life in england just as we look to dickens for pictures of the city streets and to thackeray for the vanities of society of all the women writers who have helped and are still helping to place our english novels at the head of the world's fiction she holds at present unquestionably the highest rank life mary ann or marion evans known to us by her pen name of george eliot began to write late in life when nearly forty years of age and attained the leading position among living english novelists in the ten years between eighteen seventy and eighteen eighty after thackeray and dickens had passed away she was born at arbury farm warwickshire some twenty miles from stratford-on-avon in eighteen nineteen her parents were plain honest folk of the farmer class who brought her up in the somewhat strict religious manner of those days her father seems to have been a man of sterling integrity and of practical english sense one of those essentially noble characters who do the world's work silently and well and who by their solid worth obtain a position of influence among their fellow men a few months after george eliot's birth the family moved to another home in the parish of griff where her childhood was largely passed the scenery of the midland counties and many details of her own family life are reflected in her earlier novels thus we find her and her brother as maggie and tom tulliver in the mill on the floss her aunt as dinah morris and her mother as mrs poyser in adam bede we have a suggestion of her father in the hero of the latter novel but the picture is more fully drawn as caleb garth in middlemarch for a few years she studied at two private schools for young ladies at nuneaton and coventry but the death of her mother called her at seventeen years of age to take entire charge of the household thereafter her education was gained wholly by miscellaneous reading we have a suggestion of her method in one of her early letters in which she says my mind presents an assemblage of disjointed specimens of history ancient and modern scraps of poetry picked up from shakespeare cowper wordsworth and milton newspaper topics morsels of addison and bacon latin verbs geometry entomology and chemistry reviews and metaphysics all arrested and petrified and smothered by the fast thickening everyday accession of actual events relative anxieties and household cares and vexations when mary was twenty-one years old the family again moved this time to foles hill road near coventry here she became acquainted with the family of charles bray a prosperous ribbon manufacturer whose house was a gathering place for the free thinkers of the neighborhood the effect of this liberal atmosphere upon miss evans brought up in a narrow way with no knowledge of the world was to unsettle many of her youthful convictions from a narrow intense dogmatism she went to the other extreme of radicalism then about eighteen sixty she lost all sympathy with the freethinkers and being instinctively religious seemed to be groping after a definite faith while following the ideal of duty 
this spiritual struggle which suggests that of carlyle is undoubtedly the cause of that gloom and depression which hang like an english fog over much of her work though her biographer cross tells us that she was not by any means a sad or gloomy woman in eighteen forty nine miss evans's father died and the brays took her abroad for a tour of the continent on her return to england she wrote several liberal articles for the westminster review and presently was made assistant editor of that magazine her residence in london at this time marks a turning point in her career and the real beginning of her literary life she made strong friendships with spencer mill and other scientists of the day and through spencer met george henry lewes a miscellaneous writer whom she afterwards married under his sympathetic influence she began to write fiction for the magazines her first story being amos barton eighteen fifty seven which was later included in the scenes of clerical life eighteen fifty eight her first long novel adam bede appeared early in eighteen fifty nine and met with such popular favor that to the end of her life she despaired of ever again repeating her triumph but the unexpected success proved to be an inspiration and she completed the mill on the floss and began silas marner during the following year not until the great success of these works led to an insistent demand to know the author did the english public learn that it was a woman and not an english clergyman as they supposed who had suddenly jumped to the front rank of living writers up to this point george eliot had confined herself to english country life but now she suddenly abandoned the scenes and the people with whom she was most familiar in order to write an historical novel it was in eighteen sixty while traveling in italy that she formed the great project of romola a mingling of fiction and moral philosophy against the background of the mighty renaissance movement in this she was writing of things of which she had no personal knowledge and the book cost her many months of hard and depressing labor she said herself that she was a young woman when she began the work and an old woman when she finished it romola eighteen sixty two eighteen sixty three was not successful with the public and the same may be said of felix holt the radical eighteen sixty six and the spanish gypsy eighteen sixty eight the last named work was the result of the author's ambition to write a dramatic poem which should duplicate the lesson of romola and for the purpose of gathering material she visited spain which she had decided upon as the scene of her poetical effort with the publication of middlemarch eighteen seventy one eighteen seventy two george eliot came back again into popular favor though this work is less spontaneous and more labored and pedantic than her earlier novels the fault of too much analysis and moralizing was even more conspicuous in daniel de ronda eighteen seventy six which she regarded as her greatest book her life during all this time was singularly uneventful and the chief milestones along the road mark the publication of her successive novels during all the years of her literary success her husband Luz had been the most sympathetic friend and critic and when he died in eighteen seventy eight the loss seemed to be more than she could bear her letters of this period are touching in their loneliness and their craving for sympathy later she astonished everybody by marrying john walter cross much younger than herself who is known as her biographer deep down below there is a river of sadness but i am able to enjoy my newly reopened life writes this woman of sixty who ever since she was a girl whom we know as maggie tulliver must always have some one to love and to depend upon her new interest in life lasted but a few months for she died in december of the same year eighteen eighty one of the best indications of her strength and her limitations is her portrait 
with its strong masculine features suggesting both by resemblance and by contrast that wonderful portrait of savonarola which hangs over his old desk in the monastery at florence works of george eliot these are conveniently divided into three groups corresponding to the three periods of her life the first group includes all her early essays and miscellaneous work from her translation of strauss's leben jesu in eighteen forty six to her union with luz in eighteen fifty four the second group includes scenes of clerical life adam bede mill on the floss and silas marner all published between eighteen fifty eight and eighteen sixty one these four novels of the middle period are founded on the author's own life and experience their scenes are laid in the country and their characters are taken from the stolid people of the midlands with whom george eliot had been familiar since childhood they are probably the author's most enduring works they have a naturalness a spontaneity at times a flash of real humor which are lacking in her later novels and they show a rapid development of literary power which reaches a climax in silas marner the novel of italian life romola eighteen sixty two eighteen sixty three marks a transition to the third group which includes three more novels felix holt eighteen sixty six middlemarch eighteen seventy one eighteen seventy two daniel de ronda eighteen seventy six the ambitious dramatic poem the spanish gypsy eighteen sixty eight and a collection of miscellaneous essays called the impressions of theophrastus such eighteen seventy nine the general impression of these works is not so favorable as that produced by the novels of the middle period they are more labored and less interesting they contain much deep reflection and analysis of character but less observation less delight in picturing country life as it is and very little of what we call inspiration we must add however that this does not express a unanimous literary judgment for critics are not wanting who assert that daniel de ronda is the highest expression of the author's genius general character the general character of all these novels may be described in the author's own term as psychologic realism this means that george eliot sought to do in her novels what browning attempted in his poetry that is to represent the inner struggle of a soul and to reveal the motives impulses and hereditary influences which govern human action browning generally stops when he tells his story and either lets you draw your own conclusion or else gives you his in a few striking lines but george eliot is not content until she has minutely explained the motives of her characters and the moral lesson to be learned from them moreover it is the development of a soul the slow growth or decline of moral power which chiefly interests her her heroes and heroines differ radically from those of dickens and thackeray in this respect that when we meet the men and women of the latter novelists their characters are already formed and we are reasonably sure what they will do under given circumstances in george eliot's novels the characters develop gradually as we come to know them they go from weakness to strength or from strength to weakness according to the works that they do and the thoughts that they cherish in romola for instance tito as we first meet him may be either good or bad and we know not whether he will finally turn to the right hand or the left as time passes we see him degenerate steadily because he follows his selfish impulses while romola whose character is at first only faintly indicated grows into beauty and strength with every act of self-renunciation moral teaching in these two characters tito and romola we have an epitome of our author's moral teaching the principle of law was in the air during the victorian era and we have already noted how deeply tennyson was influenced by it with george eliot law is like fate it overwhelms personal freedom and inclination moral law was to her as inevitable as automatic as gravitation 
tito's degeneration and the sad failure of dorothea and lydgate in middlemarch may be explained as simply as the fall of an apple or as a bruised knee when a man loses his balance a certain act produces a definite moral effect on the individual and character is the added sum of all the acts of a man's life just as the weight of a body is the sum of the weights of many different atoms which constitute it the matter of rewards and punishments therefore needs no final judge or judgment since these things take care of themselves automatically in a world of inviolable moral law perhaps one thing more should be added to the general characteristics of george eliot's novels they are all rather depressing the gladsomeness of life the sunshine of smiles and laughter is denied her it is said that once when her husband remarked that her novels were all essentially sad she wept and answered that she must describe life as she had found it what to read george eliot's first stories are in some respects her best though her literary power increases during her second period culminating in silas marner and her psychological analysis is more evident in daniel de ronda on the whole it is an excellent way to begin with the freshness and inspiration of the scenes of clerical life and read her books in the order in which they were written in the first group of novels adam bede is the most natural and probably interests more readers than all the others combined the mill on the floss has a larger personal interest because it reflects much of george eliot's history and the scenes and the friends of her early life the lack of proportion in this story which gives rather too much space to the girl and boy experiences is naturally explained by the tendency in every man and woman to linger over early memories silas marner silas marner is artistically the most perfect of george eliot's novels and we venture to analyze it as typical of her ideals and methods we note first the style which is heavy and a little self-conscious lacking the vigor and picturesqueness of dickens and the grace and naturalness of thackeray the characters are the common people of the midlands the hero being a linen weaver a lonely outcast who hoards and gloats over his hard-earned money is robbed thrown into utter despair and brought back to life and happiness by the coming of an abandoned child to his fire in the development of her story the author shows herself first a realist by the naturalness of her characters and the minute accuracy with which she reproduces their ways and even the accents of their speech second a psychologist by the continual analysis and explanation of motives third a moralist by showing in each individual the action and reaction of universal moral forces and especially by making every evil act bring inevitable punishment to the man who does it tragedy therefore plays a large part in the story for according to george eliot tragedy and suffering walk close behind us or lurk at every turn in the road of life like all her novels silas marner is depressing we turn away from even the wedding of epi which is just as it should be with a sense of sadness and incompleteness finally as we close the book we are conscious of a powerful and enduring impression of reality silas the poor weaver godfrey cass the well-meaning selfish man mr macy the garrulous and observant parish clerk dolly winthrop the kind-hearted countrywoman who cannot understand the mysteries of religion and so interprets god in terms of human love these are real people whom having once met we can never forget romola romola has the same general moral theme as the english novels but the scenes are entirely different and opinion is divided as to the comparative merit of the work it is a study a very profound study of moral development in one character and of moral degeneracy in another its characters and its scenes are both italian and the action takes place during a critical period of the renaissance movement 
when savonarola was at the height of his power in florence here is a magnificent theme and a superb background for a great novel and george eliot read and studied till she felt sure that she understood the place the time and the people of her story romola is therefore interesting reading in many respects the most interesting of her works it has been called one of our greatest historical novels but as such it has one grievous fault it is not quite true to the people or even to the locality which it endeavors to represent one who reads it here in a new and different land thinks only of the story and of the novelist's power but one who reads it on the spot which it describes and amidst the life which it pictures is continually haunted by the suggestion that george eliot understood neither italy nor the italians it is this lack of harmony with italian life itself which caused morris and rossetti and even browning with all his admiration for the author to lay aside the book unable to read it with pleasure or profit in a word romola is a great moral study and a very interesting book but the characters are not italian and the novel as a whole lacks the strong reality which marks george eliot's english studies End of section fifty seven section fifty eight of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven continued minor novelists of the victorian age in the three great novelists just considered we have an epitome of the fiction of the age dickens using the novel to solve social problems thackeray to paint the life of society as he saw it and george eliot to teach the fundamental principles of morality the influence of these three writers is reflected in all the minor novelists of the victorian age thus dickens is reflected in charles reed thackeray in anthony trollope and the bronte sisters and george eliot's psychology finds artistic expression in george meredith to these social and moral and realistic studies we should add the element of romance from which few of our modern novelists can long escape the nineteenth century which began with the romanticism of walter scott returns to its first love like a man glad to be home in its delight over blackmore's lorna doone and the romances of robert louis stevenson charles reed in his fondness for stage effects for picturing the romantic side of common life and for using the novel as the instrument of social reform there is a strong suggestion of dickens in the work of charles reed eighteen fourteen eighteen eighty four thus his peg woofington is a study of stage life from behind the scenes a terrible temptation is a study of social reforms and reformers and put yourself in his place is the picture of a working man who struggles against the injustice of the trades unions his masterpiece the cloister and the hearth eighteen sixty one one of our best historical novels is a somewhat laborious study of student and vagabond life in europe in the days of the german renaissance it has small resemblance to george eliot's romola whose scene is laid in italy during the same period but the two works may well be read in succession as the efforts of two very different novelists of the same period to restore the life of an age long past anthony trollope in his realism and especially in his conception of the novel as the entertainment of an idle hour trollope eighteen fifteen eighteen eighty two is a reflection of thackeray it would be hard to find a better duplicate of becky sharp the heroine of vanity fair for instance than is found in lizzie eustace the heroine of the eustace diamonds trollope was the most industrious and systematic of modern novelists writing a definite amount each day and the wide range of his characters suggests the human comedy of balzac 
his masterpiece is barchester towers eighteen fifty seven this is a study of life in a cathedral town and is remarkable for its minute pictures of bishops and clergymen with their families and dependents it would be well to read this novel in connection with the warden eighteen fifty five the last chronicle of barset eighteen sixty seven and other novels of the same series since the scenes and characters are the same in all these books and they are undoubtedly the best expression of the author's genius hawthorne says of his novels they precisely suit my taste solid and substantial and just as real as if some giant had hewn a great lump out of the earth and put it under a glass case with all the inhabitants going about their daily business and not suspecting that they were being made a show of charlotte bronte we have another suggestion of thackeray in the work of charlotte bronte eighteen sixteen eighteen fifty five she aimed to make her novels a realistic picture of society but she added to thackeray's realism the element of passionate and somewhat unbalanced romanticism the latter element was partly the expression of miss bronte's own nature and partly the result of her lonely and grief-stricken life which was darkened by a succession of family tragedies it will help us to understand her work if we remember that both charlotte bronte and her sister emily note emily bronte eighteen 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 forty eight was only a little less gifted than her famous sister her best-known work is wuthering heights eighteen forty seven a strong but morbid novel of love and suffering matthew arnold has said of her that for the portrayal of passion vehemence and grief emily bronte has no equal save byron an exquisite picture of emily is given in charlotte bronte's novel shirley End of note turned to literature because they found their work as governess and teacher unendurable and sought to relieve the loneliness and sadness of their own lot by creating a new world of the imagination in this new world however the sadness of the old remains and all the bronte novels have behind them an aching heart charlotte bronte's best-known work is jane eyre eighteen forty seven which with all its faults is a powerful and fascinating study of elemental love and hate reminding us vaguely of one of marlowe's tragedies this work won instant favor with the public and the author was placed in the front rank of living novelists aside from its value as a novel it is interesting in many of its early passages as the reflection of the author's own life and experience shirley eighteen forty nine and villette eighteen fifty three make up the trio of novels by which this gifted woman is generally remembered bulwer lytton edward bulwer lytton eighteen o three eighteen seventy three was an extremely versatile writer who tried almost every kind of novel known to the nineteenth century in his early life he wrote poems and dramas under the influence of byron but his first notable work pelham eighteen twenty eight one of the best of his novels was a kind of burlesque on the byronic type of gentleman as a study of contemporary manners in high society pelham has a suggestion of thackeray and the resemblance is more noticeable in other novels of the same type such as ernest maltravers eighteen thirty seven the caxtons eighteen forty eight eighteen forty nine my novel eighteen fifty three and kenelm chillingly eighteen seventy three we have a suggestion of dickens in at least two of lytton's novels paul clifford and eugene aram the heroes of which are criminals pictured as the victims rather than as the oppressors of society lytton essayed also with considerable popular success the romantic novel in the pilgrims of the rhine and zanoni and tried the ghost story in the haunted and the haunters his fame at the present day rests largely upon his historical novels in imitation of walter scott the last days of pompeii eighteen thirty four rietza eighteen thirty five and harold eighteen forty eight the last being his most ambitious attempt to make the novel the supplement of history in all his novels lytton is inclined to sentimentalism and sensationalism and his works though generally interesting seem hardly worthy of a high place in the history of fiction kingsley 
entirely different in spirit are the novels of the scholarly clergyman charles kingsley eighteen nineteen eighteen seventy five his works naturally divide themselves into three classes in the first are his social studies and problem novels such as alton locke eighteen fifty having for its hero a london tailor and poet and yeast eighteen forty eight which deals with the problem of the agricultural laborer in the second class are his historical novels hereward the wake hypatia and westward ho hypatia is a dramatic story of christianity in contact with paganism having its scene laid in alexandria at the beginning of the fifth century westward ho eighteen fifty five his best known work is a stirring tale of english conquest by land and sea in the days of elizabeth in the third class are his various miscellaneous works not the least of which is water babies a fascinating story of a chimney sweep which mothers read to their children at bedtime to the great delight of the round-eyed little listeners under the counterpane mrs gaskell mrs elizabeth gaskell eighteen ten eighteen sixty five began like kingsley with the idea of making the novel the instrument of social reform as the wife of a clergyman in manchester she had come in close contact with the struggles and ideals of the industrial poor of a great city and she reflected her sympathy as well as her observation in mary barton eighteen forty eight and in north and south eighteen fifty five between these two problem novels she published her masterpiece cranford in eighteen fifty three the original of this country village which is given over to spinsters is undoubtedly nutsford in cheshire where mrs gaskell had spent her childhood the sympathy the keen observation and the gentle humor with which the small affairs of a country village are described make cranford one of the most delightful stories in the english language we are indebted to mrs gaskell also for the life of charlotte bronte which is one of our best biographies blackmore richard doddridge blackmore eighteen twenty five nineteen hundred was a prolific writer but he owes his fame almost entirely to one splendid novel lorna doone which was published in eighteen sixty nine the scene of this fascinating romance is laid in exmoor in the seventeenth century the story abounds in romantic scenes and incidents its descriptions of natural scenery are unsurpassed the rhythmic language is at times almost equal to poetry and the whole tone of the book is wholesome and refreshing altogether it would be hard to find a more delightful romance in any language and it well deserves the place it has won as one of the classics of our literature other works of blackmore which will repay the reader are clara vaughan eighteen sixty four his first novel the maid of scare eighteen seventy two springhaven eighteen eighty seven pearly cross eighteen ninety four and tales from the telling house eighteen ninety six but none of these though he counted them his best work has met with the same favor as lorna doone meredith so much does george meredith eighteen twenty eight nineteen o nine belong to our own day that it is difficult to think of him as one of the victorian novelists his first notable work the ordeal of richard feverell was published in eighteen fifty nine the same year as george eliot's adam bede but it was not till the publication of diana of the crossways in eighteen eighty five that his power as a novelist was widely recognized he resembles browning not only in his condensed style packed with thought but also in this respect that he labored for years in obscurity and after much of his best work was published and apparently forgotten he slowly won the leading place in english fiction we are still too near to him to speak of the permanence of his work but a casual reading of any of his novels suggests a comparison and a contrast with george eliot like her he is a realist and a psychologist but while george eliot uses tragedy to teach a moral lesson meredith depends more upon comedy 
making vice not terrible but ridiculous for the hero or heroine of her novel george eliot invariably takes an individual and shows in each one the play of universal moral forces meredith constructs a type man as a hero and makes this type express his purpose and meaning so his characters seldom speak naturally as george eliot's do they are more like browning's characters in packing a whole paragraph into a single sentence or an exclamation on account of his enigmatic style and his psychology meredith will never be popular but by thoughtful men and women he will probably be ranked among our greatest writers of fiction the simplest and easiest of his novels for a beginner is the adventures of henry richmond eighteen seventy one among the best of his works besides the two mentioned above are beauchamp's career eighteen seventy six and the egoist eighteen seventy nine the latter is in our personal judgment one of the strongest and most convincing novels of the victorian age hardy thomas hardy eighteen forty seems like meredith to belong to the present rather than to a past age and an interesting comparison may be drawn between these two novelists in style meredith is obscure and difficult while hardy is direct and simple aiming at realism in all things meredith makes man the most important phenomenon in the universe and the struggles of men are brightened by the hope of victory hardy makes man an insignificant part of the world struggling against powers greater than himself sometimes against systems which he cannot reach or influence sometimes against a kind of grim world spirit who delights in making human affairs go wrong he is therefore hardly a realist but rather a man blinded by pessimism and his novels though generally powerful and sometimes fascinating are not pleasant or wholesome reading from the reader's viewpoint some of his earlier works like the idyllic love story under the greenwood tree eighteen seventy two and a pair of blue eyes eighteen seventy three are the most interesting hardy became noted however when he published far from the matting crowd a book which when it appeared anonymously in the cornhill magazine eighteen seventy four was generally attributed to george eliot for the simple reason that no other novelist was supposed to be capable of writing it the return of the native eighteen seventy eight and the woodlanders are generally regarded as hardy's masterpieces but two novels of our own day tess of the d'urbervilles eighteen ninety one and jude the obscure eighteen ninety five are better expressions of hardy's literary art and of his gloomy philosophy stevenson in pleasing contrast with hardy is robert louis stevenson eighteen fifty eighteen ninety four a brave cheery wholesome spirit who has made us all braver and cheerier by what he has written aside from their intrinsic value stevenson's novels are interesting in this respect that they mark a return to the pure romanticism of walter scott the novel of the nineteenth century had as we have shown a very definite purpose it aimed not only to represent life but to correct it and to offer a solution to pressing moral and social problems at the end of the century hardy's gloom in the face of modern social conditions became oppressive and stevenson broke away from it into that land of delightful romance in which youth finds an answer to all its questions problems differ but youth is ever the same and therefore stevenson will probably be regarded by future generations as one of our most enduring writers to his life with its heroically happy struggle first against poverty then against physical illness it is impossible to do justice in a short article even a longer biography is inadequate for stevenson's spirit not the incidents of his life is the important thing and the spirit has no biographer though he had written much better work earlier he first gained fame by his treasure island eighteen eighty three an absorbing story of pirates and of a hunt for buried gold dr jekyll and mr hyde eighteen eighty six 
is a profound ethical parable in which however stevenson leaves the psychology and the minute analysis of character to his readers and makes the story the chief thing in his novel kidnapped eighteen eighty six the master of ballantry eighteen eighty nine and david balfour eighteen ninety three are novels of adventure giving us vivid pictures of scotch life two romances left unfinished by his early death in samoa are the ware of hermiston and st ives the latter was finished by quiller couch in eighteen ninety seven the former is happily just as stevenson left it and though unfinished is generally regarded as his masterpiece in addition to these novels stevenson wrote a large number of essays the best of which are collected in virginibus puerisque familiar studies of men and books and memories and portraits delightful sketches of his travels are found in an inland voyage eighteen seventy eight travels with a donkey eighteen seventy nine across the plains eighteen ninety two and the amateur immigrant eighteen ninety four underwoods eighteen eighty seven is an exquisite little volume of poetry and a child's garden of verses is one of the books that mothers will always keep to read to their children in all his books stevenson gives the impression of a man at play rather than at work and the reader soon shares in the happy spirit of the author because of his beautiful personality and because of the love and admiration he awakened for himself in multitudes of readers we are naturally inclined to exaggerate his importance as a writer however that may be a study of his works shows him to be a consummate literary artist his style is always simple often perfect and both in his manner and in his matter he exercises a profound influence on the writers of the present generation End of section fifty eight section fifty nine of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven continued part three essayists of the victorian age thomas babington macaulay eighteen hundred eighteen fifty nine macaulay is one of the most typical figures of the nineteenth century though not a great writer if we compare him with browning or thackeray he was more closely associated than any of his literary contemporaries with the social and political struggles of the age while carlyle was proclaiming the gospel of labor and dickens writing novels to better the condition of the poor macaulay went vigorously to work on what he thought to be the most important task of the hour and by his brilliant speeches did perhaps more than any other single man to force the passage of the famous reform bill like many of the elizabethans he was a practical man of affairs rather than a literary man and though we miss in his writings the imagination and the spiritual insight which stamp the literary genius we have the impression always of a keen practical honest mind which looks at present problems in the light of past experience moreover the man himself with his marvelous mind his happy spirit and his absolute integrity of character is an inspiration to better living life macaulay was born at rothley temple leicestershire in eighteen hundred his father of scotch descent was at one time governor of the sierra leone colony for liberated negroes and devoted a large part of his life to the abolition of the slave trade his mother of quaker parentage was a brilliant sensitive woman whose character is reflected in that of her son the influence of these two and the son's loyal devotion to his family can best be read in trevelyan's interesting biography as a child macaulay is strongly suggestive of coleridge at three years of age he began to read eagerly at five he talked like a book at ten he had written a compendium of universal history besides various hymns verse romances arguments for christianity and one ambitious epic poem 
the habit of rapid reading begun in childhood continued throughout his life and the number and variety of books which he read is almost incredible his memory was phenomenal he could repeat long poems and essays after a single reading he could quote not only passages but the greater part of many books including pilgrim's progress paradise lost and various novels like clarissa once to test his memory he recited two newspaper poems which he had read in a coffee-house forty years before and which he had never thought of in the interval at twelve years of age this remarkable boy was sent to a private school at little shelford at eighteen he entered trinity college cambridge here he made a reputation as a classical scholar and a brilliant talker but made a failure of his mathematics in a letter to his mother he wrote oh four words to express my abomination of that science discipline of the mind say rather starvation confinement torture annihilation we quote this as a commentary on macaulay's later writings which are frequently lacking in the exactness and the logical sequence of the science which he detested after his college course macaulay studied law was admitted to the bar devoted himself largely to politics entered parliament in eighteen thirty and almost immediately won a reputation as the best debater and the most eloquent speaker of the liberal or whig party gladstone says of him whenever he arose to speak it was a summons like a trumpet call to fill the benches at the time of his election he was poor and the loss of his father's property threw upon him the support of his brothers and sisters but he took up the burden with cheerful courage and by his own efforts soon placed himself and his family in comfort his political progress was rapid and was due not to favoritism or intrigue but to his ability his hard work and his sterling character he was several times elected to parliament was legal adviser to the supreme council of india was a member of the cabinet and declined many offices for which other men labor a lifetime in eighteen fifty seven his great ability and services to his country were recognized by his being raised to the peerage with the title of baron macaulay of rothley macaulay's literary work began in college with the contribution of various ballads and essays to the magazines in his later life practical affairs claimed the greater part of his time and his brilliant essays were written in the early morning or late at night his famous essay on milton appeared in the edinburgh review in eighteen twenty five it created a sensation and macaulay having gained the ear of the public never once lost it during the twenty years in which he was a contributor to the magazines his lays of ancient rome appeared in eighteen forty two and in the following year three volumes of his collected essays in eighteen forty seven he lost his seat in parliament temporarily through his zealous efforts in behalf of religious toleration and the loss was most fortunate since it gave him opportunity to begin his history of england a monumental work which he had been planning for many years the first two volumes appeared in eighteen forty eight and their success can be compared only to that of the most popular novels the third and fourth volumes of the history eighteen fifty five were even more successful and macaulay was hard at work on the remaining volumes when he died quite suddenly in eighteen fifty nine he was buried near addison in the poet's corner of westminster abbey a paragraph from one of his letters written at the height of his fame and influence may give us an insight into his life and work i can truly say that i have not for many years been so happy as i am at present i am free i am independent i am in parliament as honorably seated as a man can be my family is comfortably off i have leisure for literature yet i am not reduced to the necessity of writing for money if i had to choose a lot from all that there are in human life i am not sure that i should prefer any to that which has fallen to me i am sincerely and thoroughly contented essay on milton works of macaulay 
macaulay is famous in literature for his essays for his martial ballads and for his history of england his first important work the essay on milton 1825 is worthy of study not only for itself as a critical estimate of the puritan poet but as a key to all macaulay's writings here first of all is an interesting work which however much we differ from the author's opinion holds our attention and generally makes us regret that the end comes so soon the second thing to note is the historical flavor of the essay we study not only milton but also the times in which he lived and the great movements of which he was a part history and literature properly belong together and macaulay was one of the first writers to explain the historical conditions which partly account for a writer's work and influence the third thing to note is macaulay's enthusiasm for his subject an enthusiasm which is often partisan but which we gladly share for the moment as we follow the breathless narrative macaulay generally makes a hero of his man shows him battling against odds and the heroic side of our own nature awakens and responds to the author's plea the fourth and perhaps most characteristic thing in the essay is the style which is remarkably clear forceful and convincing jeffrey the editor of the edinburgh review wrote enthusiastically when he received the manuscript the more i think the less i can conceive where you picked up that style we still share in the editor's wonder but the more we think the less we conceive that such a style could be picked up it was partly the result of a well-stored mind partly of unconscious imitation of other writers and partly of that natural talent for clear speaking and writing which is manifest in all macaulay's work other essays in the remaining essays we find the same general qualities which characterize macaulay's first attempt they cover a wide range of subjects but they may be divided into two general classes the literary or critical and the historical of the literary essays the best are those on milton addison goldsmith byron dryden leigh hunt bunyan bacon and johnson among the best known of the historical essays are those on lord clive chatham warren hastings hallam's constitutional history von Ranke's history of the papacy frederick the great horace walpole william pitt sir william temple machiavelli and mirabeau most of these were produced in the vigor of young manhood between eighteen twenty five and eighteen forty five while the writer was busy with practical affairs of state they are often one-sided and inaccurate but always interesting and from them a large number of busy people have derived their first knowledge of history and literature lays of ancient rome the best of macaulay's poetical work is found in the lays of ancient rome eighteen forty two a collection of ballads in the style of scott which sing of the old heroic days of the roman republic the ballad does not require much thought or emotion it demands clearness vigor enthusiasm action and it suited macaulay's genius perfectly he was however much more careful than other ballad writers in making his narrative true to tradition the stirring martial spirit of these ballads their fine workmanship and their appeal to courage and patriotism made them instantly popular even to-day after more than fifty years such ballads as those on virginius and horatius at the bridge are favorite pieces in many school readers history of england the history of england macaulay's masterpiece is still one of the most popular historical works in the english language originally it was intended to cover the period from the accession of james the second in sixteen eighty five to the death of george the fourth in eighteen thirty only five volumes of the work were finished and so thoroughly did macaulay go into details that these five volumes cover only sixteen years it has been estimated that to complete the work on the same scale would require some fifty volumes and the labor of one man for over a century in his historical method macaulay suggests gibbon 
his own knowledge of history was very great but before writing he read numberless pages consulted original documents and visited the scenes which he intended to describe thackeray's remark that macaulay reads twenty books to write a sentence and travels one hundred miles to make a line of description is in view of his industry a well-warranted exaggeration as in his literary essays he is fond of making heroes and he throws himself so heartily into the spirit of the scene he is describing that his word pictures almost startle us by their vivid reality the story of monmouth's rebellion for instance or the trial of the seven bishops is as fascinating as the best chapters of scott's historical novels while macaulay's search for original sources of information suggests the scientific historian his use of his material is much more like that of a novelist or playwright in his essay on machiavelli he writes the best portraits are perhaps those in which there is a slight mixture of caricature and we are not certain that the best histories are not those in which a little of the exaggeration of fictitious narrative is judiciously employed something is lost in accuracy but much is gained in effect whether this estimate of historical writing be true or false macaulay employed it in his own work and made his narrative as absorbing as a novel to all his characters he gives the reality of flesh and blood and in his own words he shows us over their houses and seats us at their tables all that is excellent but it has its disadvantages in his admiration for heroism macaulay makes some of his characters too good and others too bad in his zeal for details he misses the importance of great movements and of great leaders who are accustomed to ignore details and in his joy of describing events he often loses sight of underlying causes in a word he is without historical insight and his work though fascinating is seldom placed among the reliable histories of england general characteristics to the reader who studies macaulay's brilliant essays and a few chosen chapters of his history three things soon become manifest first macaulay's art is that of a public speaker rather than that of a literary man he has a wonderful command of language and he makes his meaning clear by striking phrases vigorous antitheses anecdotes and illustrations his style is so clear that he who runs may read and from beginning to end he never loses the attention of his readers second macaulay's good spirits and enthusiasm are contagious as he said of himself he wrote out of a full head chiefly for his own pleasure or recreation and one who writes joyously generally awakens a sense of pleasure in his readers third macaulay has the defect of his qualities he reads and remembers so much that he has no time to think or to form settled opinions as gladstone said macaulay is always conversing or recollecting or reading or composing but reflecting never so he wrote his brilliant essay on milton which took all england by storm and said of it afterward that it contained scarcely a paragraph which his mature judgment approved whether he speaks or writes he has always before him an eager audience and he feels within him the born orator's power to hold and fascinate so he gives loose rein to his enthusiasm quotes from a hundred books and in his delight at entertaining us forgets that the first quality of a critical or historical work is to be accurate and the second to be interesting end of section fifty nine section sixty of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven continued thomas carlyle seventeen ninety five eighteen eighty one 
in marked contrast with macaulay the brilliant and cheerful essayist is thomas carlyle the prophet and censor of the nineteenth century macaulay is the practical man of affairs helping and rejoicing in the progress of his beloved england carlyle lives apart from all practical interests looks with distrust on the progress of his age and tells men that truth justice and immortality are the only worthy objects of human endeavor macaulay is delighted with material comforts he is most at home in brilliant and fashionable company and he writes even when ill and suffering with unfailing hopefulness and good nature carlyle is like a hebrew prophet just in from the desert and the burden of his message is woe to them that are at ease in zion both men are in different ways typical of the century and somewhere between the two extremes the practical helpful activity of macaulay and the spiritual agony and conflict of carlyle we shall find the measure of an age which has left the deepest impress upon our own life of carlyle carlyle was born at ecclefechan dumfreshire in seventeen ninety five a few months before burns death and before scott had published his first work like burns he came of peasant stock strong simple god-fearing folk whose influence in carlyle's later life is beyond calculation of his mother he says she was too mild and peaceful for the planet she lived in and of his father a stonemason he writes could i write my books as he built his houses walk my way so manfully through this shadow world and leave it with so little blame it were more than all my hopes of carlyle's early school life we have some interesting glimpses in sartor resartus at nine years he entered the anan grammar school where he was bullied by the older boys who nicknamed him tom the tearful for the teachers of those days he has only ridicule calling them hide-bound pedants and he calls the school by the suggestive german name of hinterschlag gymnasium at the wish of his parents who intended carlyle for the ministry he endured this hateful school life till eighteen o nine when he entered edinburgh university there he spent five miserable years of which his own record is i was without friends experience or connection in the sphere of human business was of sly humor proud enough and to spare and had begun my long curriculum of dyspepsia this nagging illness was the cause of much of that irritability of temper which frequently led him to scold the public and for which he has been harshly handled by unfriendly critics the period following his university course was one of storm and stress for carlyle much to the grief of the father whom he loved he had given up the idea of entering the ministry wherever he turned doubts like a thick fog surrounded him doubts of god of his fellow-men of human progress of himself he was poor and to earn an honest living was his first problem he tried successively teaching school tutoring the study of law and writing miscellaneous articles for the edinburgh encyclopedia all the while he was fighting his doubts living as he says in a continual indefinite pining fear after six or seven years of mental agony which has at times a suggestion of bunyan's spiritual struggle the crisis came in eighteen twenty one when carlyle suddenly shook off his doubts and found himself all at once he says in sartor there arose a thought in me and i asked myself what art thou afraid of wherefore like a coward dost thou for ever pip and whimper and go cowering and trembling despicable biped what is the sum total of the worst that lies before thee death well death and say the pangs of tophet too and all that the devil and man may will or can do against thee hast thou not a heart canst thou not suffer whatsoever it be and as a child of freedom though outcast 
trample tophet itself under thy feet while it consumes thee let it come then i will meet it and defy it and as i so thought there rushed like a stream of fire over my whole soul and i shook base fear away from me for ever this struggle between fear and faith and the triumph of the latter is recorded in two remarkable chapters the everlasting no and the everlasting yea of sartor risartus carlyle now definitely resolved on a literary life and began with any work that offered a bare livelihood he translated legendre's geometry from the french wrote numerous essays for the magazines and continued his study of german while making translations from that language his translations of goethe's wilhelm meister appeared in eighteen twenty four his life of schiller in eighteen twenty five and his specimens of german romance in eighteen twenty seven he began at this time a correspondence with goethe his literary hero which lasted till the german poet's death in eighteen thirty two while still busy with hack work carlyle in eighteen twenty six married jane welsh a brilliant and beautiful woman whose literary genius almost equaled that of her husband soon afterwards influenced chiefly by poverty the carlyles retired to a farm at cregen puttock parentheses hawks hill a dreary and lonely spot far from friends and even neighbors they remained here six years during which time carlyle wrote many of his best essays and sartor risartus his most original work the latter went begging among publishers for two years and was finally published serially in fraser's magazine in eighteen thirty three eighteen thirty four by this time carlyle had begun to attract attention as a writer and thinking that one who made his living by the magazines should be in close touch with the editors took his wife's advice and moved to london to seek work and bread he settled in shen row chelsea a place made famous by moore erasmus bolingbroke smollett leigh hunt and many lesser lights of literature he began to enjoy the first real peace he had known since childhood in eighteen thirty seven appeared the french revolution which first made carlyle famous and in the same year led by the necessity of earning money he began the series of lectures german literature eighteen thirty seven periods of european culture eighteen thirty eight revolutions of modern europe eighteen thirty nine heroes and hero worship eighteen forty one which created a sensation in london it was says lee hunt as if some puritan had come to life again liberalized by german philosophy and his own intense reflection and experience though carlyle set himself against the spirit of his age calling the famous reform bill a progress into darkness and democracy the rule of the worst rather than the best his rough sincerity was unquestioned and his remarks were more quoted than those of any other living man he was supported moreover by a rare circle of friends edward irving southey sterling lander lee hunt dickens mill tennyson browning and most helpful of all emerson who had visited carlyle at craig and Puttock in eighteen thirty three it was due largely to emerson's influence that carlyle's works were better appreciated and brought better financial rewards in america than in england carlyle's fame reached its climax in the monumental history of frederick the great eighteen fifty eight eighteen sixty five published after thirteen years of solitary toil which in his own words made entire devastation of home life and happiness the proudest moment of his life was when he was elected to succeed gladstone as lord rector of edinburgh university in eighteen sixty five the year in which frederick the great was finished in the midst of his triumph and while he was in scotland to deliver his inaugural address his happiness was suddenly destroyed by the death of his wife a terrible blow from which he never recovered he lived on for fifteen years shorn of his strength and interest in life 
and his closing hours were like the dull sunset of a november day only as we remember his grief and remorse at the death of the companion who had shared his toil but not his triumph can we understand the sorrow that pervades the pages of his reminiscences he died in eighteen eighty one and at his own wish was buried not in westminster abbey but among his humble kinsfolk in ecclefechan however much we may differ from his philosophy or regret the harshness of his minor works we shall probably all agree in this sentiment from one of his own letters that the object of all his struggle and writing was that men should find out and believe the truth and match their lives to it works of carlyle there are two widely different judgments of carlyle as a man and a writer the first which is founded largely on his minor writings like chartism latter-day pamphlets and shooting niagara declares that he is a misanthrope and dyspeptic with a barbarous style of writing that he denounces progress democracy science america darwin everybody and everything that he does not understand that his literary opinions are largely prejudices that he began as a prophet and ended as a scold and that in denouncing shams of every sort he was something of a sham himself since his practice was not in accord with his own preaching the second judgment which is founded upon heroes and hero worship cromwell and sartor resartus declares that these works are the supreme manifestation of genius that their rugged picturesque style makes others look feeble or colorless by comparison and that the author is the greatest teacher leader and prophet of the nineteenth century somewhere between these two extremes will be found the truth about carlyle we only note here that while there are some grounds for the first unfavorable criticism we are to judge an author by his best rather than by his worst work and that a man's aims as well as his accomplishments must be taken into consideration as it is written whereas it was in thine heart to build an house unto my name thou didst well that it was in thine heart whatever the defects of carlyle and his work in his heart he was always planning a house or temple to the god of truth and justice carlyle's important works may be divided into three general classes critical and literary essays historical works and sartor resartus the last being in a class by itself since there is nothing like it in literature to these should be added a biography the admirable life of john sterling and carlyle's letters and reminiscences which are more interesting and suggestive than some of his better known works we omit here all consideration of translations and his intemperate denunciations of men and institutions in chartism latter-day pamphlets and other essays which add nothing to the author's fame or influence essay on burns of the essays which are all characterized by carlyle's zeal to get at the heart of things and to reveal the soul rather than the works of a writer the best are those on burns scott novalis goethe characteristics signs of the times and boswell's life of johnson note the student should remember that carlyle's literary opinions though very positive are to be received with caution sometimes indeed they are so one-sided and prejudiced that they are more valuable as a revelation of carlyle himself than as a study of the author he is considering End of note. in the famous essay on burns which is generally selected for special study we note four significant things one carlyle is peculiarly well fitted for his task having many points in common with his hero two in most of his work carlyle by his style and mannerisms and positive opinions generally attracts our attention away from his subject but in this essay he shows himself capable of forgetting himself for a moment to an unusual extent he sticks to his subject and makes us think of burns rather than of carlyle the style though unpolished is fairly simple and readable and is free from the breaks crudities ejaculations and general 
nodulosities which disfigure much of his work three carlyle has an original and interesting theory of biography and criticism the object of criticism is to show the man himself his aims ideals and outlooks on the universe the object of biography is to show what and how produced was the effect of society upon him what and how produced was his effect on society for carlyle is often severe even harsh in his estimates of other men but in this case the tragedy of burns life of fragments attracts and softens him he grows enthusiastic and a rare thing for carlyle apologizes for his enthusiasm in the striking sentence we love burns and we pity him and love and pity are prone to magnify so he gives us the most tender and appreciative of his essays and one of the most illuminating criticisms of burns that has appeared in our language heroes and hero worship the central idea of carlyle's historical works is found in his heroes and hero worship eighteen forty one his most widely read book universal history he says is at bottom the history of the great men who have worked here to get at the truth of history we must study not movements but men and read not state papers but the biographies of heroes his summary of history as presented in this work has six divisions one the hero as divinity having for its general subject odin the type norseman who carlyle thinks was some old heroic chief afterwards deified by his countrymen two the hero as prophet treating of mahomet and the rise of islam three the hero as poet in which dante and shakespeare are taken as types four the hero as priest or religious leader in which luther appears as the hero of the reformation and knox as the hero of puritanism five the hero as man of letters in which we have the curious choice of johnson rousseau and burns six the hero as king in which cromwell and napoleon appear as the heroes of reform by revolution it is needless to say that heroes is not a book of history neither is it scientifically written in the manner of gibbon with science in any form carlyle had no patience and he miscalculated the value of that patient search for facts and evidence which science undertakes before building any theories either of kings or cabbages the book therefore abounds in errors but they are the errors of carelessness and are perhaps of small consequence his misconception of history however is more serious with the modern idea of history as the growth of freedom among all classes he has no sympathy the progress of democracy was to him an evil thing a turning of the face towards darkness and anarchy at certain periods according to carlyle god sends us geniuses sometimes as priests or poets sometimes as soldiers or statesmen but in whatever guise they appear these are our real rulers he shows moreover that whenever such men appear multitudes follow them and that a man's following is a sure index of his heroism and kingship whether we agree with carlyle or not we must accept for the moment his peculiar view of history else heroes can never open its treasures to us the book abounds in startling ideas expressed with originality and power and is pervaded throughout by an atmosphere of intense moral earnestness the more we read it the more we find to admire and to remember french revolution carlyle's french revolution eighteen thirty seven is to be taken more seriously as a historical work but here again his hero worship comes to the front and his book is a series of flashlights thrown upon men in dramatic situations rather than a tracing of causes to their consequences the very titles of his chapters astrea redux windbags 
Brogli, the war god do violence to our conception of history and are more suggestive of carlyle's individualism than of french history he is here the preacher rather than the historian his text is the eternal justice and his message is that all wrongdoing is inevitably followed by vengeance his method is intensely dramatic from a mass of historical details he selects a few picturesque incidents and striking figures and his vivid pictures of the storming of the bastille the rush of the mob to versailles the death of louis the sixteenth and the reign of terror seem like the work of an eye-witness describing some terrible catastrophe at times as it portrays danton robespierre and the great characters of the tragedy carlyle's work is suggestive of an historical play of shakespeare and again as it describes the rush and riot of men led by elemental passion it is more like a great prose epic though not a reliable history in any sense it is one of the most dramatic and stirring narratives in our language oliver cromwell two other historical works deserve at least a passing notice the history of frederick the great eighteen fifty eight eighteen sixty five in six volumes is a colossal picture of the life and times of the hero of the prussian empire oliver cromwell's letters and speeches is in our personal judgment carlyle's best historical work his idea is to present the very soul of the great puritan leader he gives us as of first importance cromwell's own words and connects them by a commentary in which other men and events are described with vigor and vividness cromwell was one of carlyle's greatest heroes and in this case he is most careful to present the facts which occasion his own enthusiasm the result is on the whole the most lifelike picture of a great historical character that we possess other historians had heaped calumny upon cromwell till the english public regarded him with prejudice and horror and it is an indication of carlyle's power that by a single book he revolutionized england's opinion of one of her greatest men sartor risartus carlyle's sartor risartus eighteen thirty four his only creative work is a mixture of philosophy and romance of wisdom and nonsense a chaotic jumble of the author's thoughts feelings and experiences during the first thirty-five years of his life the title which means the tailor patched up is taken from an old scotch song the hero is diogenes teufelsdruck a german professor at the university of weissnicht wo don't know where the narrative concerns this queer professor's life and opinions and the central thought of the book is the philosophy of clothes which are considered symbolically as the outward expression of spirit thus man's body is the outward garment of his soul and the universe is the visible garment of the invisible god the arrangement of sartor is clumsy and hard to follow in order to leave himself free to bring in everything he thought about carlyle assumed the position of one who was translating and editing the old professor's manuscripts which are supposed to consist of numerous sheets stuffed into twelve paper bags each labeled with a sign of the zodiac the editor pretends to make order out of this chaos but he is free to jump from one subject to another and to state the most startling opinion by simply using quotation marks and adding a note that he is not responsible for teufelsdruck's crazy notions which are in reality carlyle's own dreams and ideals partly because of the matter which is sometimes incoherent partly because of the style which though picturesque is sometimes confused and ungrammatical sartor is not easy reading but it amply repays whatever time and study we give to it many of its passages are more like poetry than prose and one cannot read such chapters as the everlasting no the everlasting yea reminiscences and natural supernaturalism and be quite the same man afterwards 
for carlyle's thought has entered into him and he walks henceforth more gently more reverently through the world as in the presence of the eternal carlyle's style general characteristics concerning carlyle's style there are almost as many opinions as there are readers this is partly because he impresses different people in widely different ways and partly because his expression varies greatly at times he is calm persuasive grimly humorous as if conversing at other times wildly exclamatory as if he were shouting and waving his arms at the reader we have spoken of macaulay's style as that of the finished orator and we might reasonably speak of carlyle's as that of the exhorter who cares little for method so long as he makes a strong impression on his hearers every sentence is alive to its fingertips writes a modern critic and though carlyle often violates the rules of grammar and rhetoric we can well afford to let an original genius express his own intense conviction in his own vivid and picturesque way his message carlyle's message may be summed up in two imperatives labor and be sincere he lectured and wrote chiefly for the upper classes who had begun to think somewhat sentimentally of the conditions of the laboring men of the world and he demanded for the latter not charity or pity but justice and honor all labor whether of head or hand is divine and labor alone justifies a man as a son of earth and heaven to society which carlyle thought to be occupied wholly with conventional affairs he came with the stamp of sincerity calling upon men to lay aside hypocrisy and to think and speak and live the truth he had none of addison's delicate satire and humor and in his fury at what he thought was false he was generally unsympathetic and often harsh but we must not forget that thackeray who knew society much better than did carlyle gave a very unflattering picture of it in vanity fair and the book of snobs apparently the age needed plain speaking and carlyle furnished it in scripture measure harriet martineau who knew the world for which carlyle wrote summed up his influence when she said that he had infused into the mind of the english nation sincerity earnestness healthfulness and courage if we add to the above message carlyle's conceptions of the world as governed by a god of justice who never forgets and of human history as an inarticulate bible slowly revealing the divine purpose we shall understand better the force of his ethical appeal and the profound influence he exercised on moral and intellectual life of the past century End of section sixty Section 61 of English Literature by William J. Long. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 continued. John Ruskin, 1819 1900. In approaching the study of Ruskin, we are to remember, first of all, that we are dealing with a great and good man who is himself more inspiring than any of his books. In some respects, he is like his friend Carlyle, whose disciple he acknowledged himself to be, but he is broader in his sympathies and in every way more hopeful, helpful, and humane. Thus, in the face of the drudgery and poverty of the competitive system, Carlyle proposed with grim satire of Swift's modest proposal to organize an annual hunt in which successful people should shoot the unfortunate and to use the game for the support of the army and navy ruskin facing the same problem wrote i will endure it no longer quietly but henceforward with any few or many who will help do my best to abate this misery then leaving the field of art criticism where he was the acknowledged leader he begins to write of labor and justice gives his fortune in charity in establishing schools and libraries and founds his st george's guild of workingmen to put in practice the principles of brotherhood and cooperation for which he and carlyle contended though his style marks him as one of the masters of english prose he is generally studied not as a literary man but as an ethical teacher 
and we shall hardly appreciate his works unless we see behind every book the figure of the heroically sincere man who wrote it life ruskin was born in london in eighteen nineteen his father was a prosperous wine merchant who gained a fortune in trade and who spent his leisure hours in the company of good books and pictures on his tombstone one may still read this inscription written by ruskin he was an entirely honest merchant and his memory is to all who keep it dear and helpful his son whom he loved to the uttermost and taught to speak truth says this of him ruskin's mother a devout and somewhat austere woman brought her son up with puritanical strictness not forgetting solomon's injunction that the rod and reproof give wisdom of ruskin's early years at herne hill on the outskirts of london it is better to read his own interesting record in preterita it was in some respects a cramped and lonely childhood but certain things which strongly molded his character are worthy of mention first he was taught by word and example in all things to speak the truth and he never forgot the lesson second he had few toys and spent much time in studying the leaves the flowers the grass the clouds even the figures and colors of the carpet and so laid the foundation for that minute and accurate observation which is manifest in all his writings third he was educated first by his mother then by private tutors and so missed the discipline of the public schools the influence of this lonely training is evident in all his work like carlyle he is often too positive and dogmatic the result of failing to test his work by the standards of other men of his age fourth he was obliged to read the bible every day and to learn long passages verbatim the result of this training was he says to make every word of the scriptures familiar to my ear in habitual music we can hardly read a page of his later work without finding some reflection of the noble simplicity or vivid imagery of the sacred records fifth he traveled much with his father and mother and his innate love of nature was intensified by what he saw on his leisurely journeys through the most beautiful parts of england and the continent ruskin entered christ church college oxford in eighteen thirty six when only seventeen years old he was at this time a shy sensitive boy a lover of nature and of every art which reflects nature but almost entirely ignorant of the ways of boys and men an attack of consumption with which he had long been threatened caused him to leave oxford in eighteen forty and for nearly two years he wandered over italy searching for health and cheerfulness and gathering materials for the first volume of modern painters the book that made him famous ruskin's literary work began in childhood when he was encouraged to write freely in prose and poetry a volume of poems illustrated by his own drawings was published in eighteen fifty nine after he had won fame as a prose writer but save for the drawings it is of small importance the first volume of modern painters eighteen forty three was begun as a heated defense of the artist turner but it developed into an essay on art as a true picture of nature not only in her outward aspect but in her inward spirit the work which was signed simply oxford graduate aroused a storm of mingled approval and protest but however much critics warred over its theories of art all were agreed that the unknown author was a master of descriptive prose ruskin now made frequent trips to the art galleries of the continent and produced four more volumes of modern painters during the next seventeen years meanwhile he wrote other books seven lamps of architecture eighteen forty nine stones of venice eighteen fifty one eighteen fifty three pre raphaelitism and numerous lectures and essays which gave him a place in the world of art similar to that held by matthew arnold in the world of letters 
in eighteen sixty nine he was appointed professor of art at oxford a position which greatly increased his prestige and influence not only among students but among a great variety of people who heard his lectures and read his published works lectures on art aratra pentelici parentheses lectures on sculpture ariadne florentina parentheses lectures on engraving michael angelo and tintoret the art of england val d'arno parentheses lectures on tuscan art saint mark's rest parentheses a history of venice mornings in florence parentheses studies in christian art now much used as a guidebook to the picture galleries of florence the laws of fiesole parentheses a treatise on drawing and painting for schools academy of fine arts in venice pleasures of england all these works on art show ruskin's literary industry and we must also record love's miney parentheses a study of birds proserpina parentheses a study of flowers Ducalion, parentheses a study of waves and stones besides various essays on political economy which indicate that ruskin like arnold had begun to consider the practical problems of his age at the height of his fame in eighteen sixty ruskin turned for a time from art to consider questions of wealth and labor terms which were used glibly by the economists of the age without much thought for their fundamental meaning there is no wealth but life announced ruskin life including all its powers of love of joy and of admiration that country is the richest which nourishes the greatest number of noble and happy human beings such a doctrine proclaimed by goldsmith in his deserted village was regarded as a pretty sentiment but coming from one of the greatest leaders and teachers of england it was like a bombshell ruskin wrote four essays establishing this doctrine and pleading for a more socialistic form of government in which reform might be possible the essays were published in the cornhill magazine of which thackeray was editor they aroused such a storm that the publication was discontinued ruskin then published the essays in book form with the title unto this last in eighteen sixty two munera pulveris eighteen sixty two was another work in which the principles of capital and labor and the evils of the competitive system were discussed in such a way that the author was denounced as a visionary or a madman other works of this practical period are time and tide force clavigera sesame and lilies and the crown of wild olive the latter part of ruskin's life was a time of increasing sadness due partly to the failure of his plans and partly to public attacks upon his motives or upon his sanity he grew bitter at first as his critics ridiculed or denounced his principles and at times his voice is as querulous as that of carlyle we are to remember however the conditions under which he struggled his health had been shattered by successive attacks of disease he had been disappointed in love his marriage was unhappy and his work seemed a failure he had given nearly all his fortune in charity and the poor were more numerous than ever before his famous st george's guild was not successful and the tyranny of the competitive system seemed too deeply rooted to be overthrown on the death of his mother he left london and in eighteen seventy nine retired to brantwood on coniston lake in the beautiful region beloved by wordsworth here he passed the last quiet years of his life under the care of his cousin mrs severn the angel of the house and wrote at professor norton's suggestion preterita one of his most interesting books in which he describes the events of his youth from his own viewpoint he died quietly in nineteen hundred and was buried as he wished without funeral pomp or public ceremony in the little churchyard at coniston works of ruskin 
there are three little books which in popular favor stand first on the list of ruskin's numerous works ethics of the dust a series of lectures to little housewives which appeals most to women crown of wild olive three lectures on work traffic and war which appeals to thoughtful men facing the problems of work and duty and sesame and lilies which appeals to men and women alike the last is the most widely known of ruskin's works and the best with which to begin our reading sesame and lilies the first thing we notice in sesame and lilies is the symbolical title sesame taken from the story of the robbers cave in the arabian nights means a secret word or talisman which unlocks a treasure house it was intended no doubt to introduce the first part of the work called of king's treasuries which treats of books and reading lilies taken from isaiah as a symbol of beauty purity and peace introduces the second lecture of queen's gardens which is an exquisite study of woman's life and education these two lectures properly constitute the book but a third is added on the mystery of life the last begins in a monologue upon his own failures in life and is pervaded by an atmosphere of sadness sometimes of pessimism quite different from the spirit of the other two lectures king's treasuries though the theme of the first lecture is books ruskin manages to present to his audience his whole philosophy of life he gives us with a wealth of detail the description of what constitutes a real book he looks into the meaning of words and teaches us how to read using a selection from milton's lycidas as an illustration this study of words gives us the key with which we are to unlock king's treasuries that is the books which contain the precious thoughts of the kingly minds of all ages he shows the real meaning and end of education the value of labor and of a purpose in life he treats of nature science art literature religion he defines the purpose of government showing that soul life not money or trade is the measure of national greatness and he criticizes the general injustice of his age quoting a heart-rending story of toil and suffering from the newspapers to show how close his theory is to daily needs here is an astonishing variety in a small compass but there is no confusion ruskin's mind was wonderfully analytical and one subject develops naturally from the other of queen's gardens in the second lecture of queen's gardens he considers the question of woman's place and education which tennyson had attempted to answer in the princess ruskin's theory is that the purpose of all education is to acquire power to bless and to redeem human society and that in this noble work woman must always play the leading part he searches all literature for illustrations and his description of literary heroines especially of shakespeare's perfect women is unrivaled ruskin is always at his best in writing of women or for women and the lofty idealism of this essay together with its rare beauty of expression makes it on the whole the most delightful and inspiring of his works unto this last among ruskin's practical works the reader will find in fors clavigera a series of letters to working men and unto this last four essays on the principles of political economy the substance of his economic teachings in the latter work starting with the proposition that our present competitive system centers about the idea of wealth ruskin tries to find out what wealth is and the pith of his teaching is this that men are of more account than money that a man's real wealth is found in his soul not in his pocket and that the prime object of life and labor is the producing of as many as possible full-breathed bright-eyed and happy-hearted human creatures 
to make this ideal practical ruskin makes four suggestions one that training schools be established to teach young men and women three things the laws and practice of health habits of gentleness and justice and the trade or calling by which they are to live two that the government establish farms and workshops for the production of all the necessaries of life where only good and honest work shall be tolerated and where a standard of work and wages shall be maintained three that any person out of employment shall be received at the nearest government school if ignorant he shall be educated and if competent to do any work he shall have the opportunity to do it four that comfortable homes be provided for the sick and for the aged and that this be done in justice not in charity a laborer serves his country as truly as does a soldier or a statesman and a pension should be no more disgraceful in one case than in the other works on art among ruskin's numerous books treating of art we recommend the seven lamps of architecture eighteen forty nine stones of venice eighteen fifty one eighteen fifty three and the first two volumes of modern painters eighteen forty three eighteen forty six with ruskin's art theories which as sidney smith prophesied worked a complete revolution in the world of taste we need not concern ourselves here we simply point out four principles that are manifest in all his work one that the object of art as of every other human endeavor is to find and to express the truth two that art in order to be true must break away from conventionalities and copy nature three that morality is closely allied with art and that a careful study of any art reveals the moral strength or weakness of the people that produced it for that the main purpose of art is not to delight a few cultured people but to serve the daily uses of common life the giving brightness to pictures is much he says but the giving brightness to life is more in this attempt to make art serve the practical ends of life ruskin is allied with all the great writers of the period who use literature as the instrument of human progress general characteristics one who reads ruskin is in a state of mind analogous to that of a man who goes through a picture gallery pausing now to admire a face or a landscape for its own sake and again to marvel at the technical skill of the artist without regard to his subject for ruskin is a great literary artist and a great ethical teacher and we admire one page for its style and the next for its message to humanity the best of his prose which one may find in the descriptive passages of preterita and modern painters is written in a richly ornate style with a wealth of figures and allusions and at times a rhythmic melodious quality which makes it almost equal to poetry ruskin has a rare sensitiveness to beauty in every form and more perhaps than any other writer in our language he has helped us to see and appreciate the beauty of the world around us ethical teaching as for ruskin's ethical teaching it appears in so many forms and in so many different works that any summary must appear inadequate for a full half century he was the apostle of beauty in england and the beauty for which he pleaded was never sensuous or pagan as in the renaissance but always spiritual appealing to the soul of man rather than to his eyes leading to better work and better living in his economic essays ruskin is even more directly and positively ethical to mitigate the evils of the unreasonable competitive system under which we labor and sorrow to bring master and man together in mutual trust and helpfulness to seek beauty truth goodness as the chief ends of life and having found them to make our characters correspond to share the best treasures of art and literature with rich and poor alike to labor always and whether we work with hand or head to do our work in praise of something that we love 
this sums up ruskin's purpose and message and the best of it is that like chaucer's country parson he practiced his doctrine before he preached it end of section sixty one section sixty two of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven continued matthew arnold eighteen twenty two eighteen eighty eight in the world of literature arnold has occupied for many years an authoritative position as critic and teacher similar to that held by ruskin in the world of art in his literary work two very different moods are manifest in his poetry he reflects the doubt of an age which witnessed the conflict between science and revealed religion apparently he never passed through any such decisive personal struggle as is recorded in sartor resartus and he has no positive conviction such as is voiced in the everlasting yea he is beset by doubts which he never settles and his poems generally express sorrow or regret or resignation in his prose he shows the cavalier spirit aggressive light-hearted self-confident like carlyle he dislikes shams and protests against what he calls the barbarisms of society but he writes with a light touch using satire and banter as the better part of his argument carlyle denounces with the zeal of a hebrew prophet and lets you know that you are hopelessly lost if you reject his message arnold is more like the cultivated greek his voice is soft his speech suave but he leaves the impression if you happen to differ with him that you must be deficient in culture both these men so different in spirit and methods confronted the same problems sought the same ends and were dominated by the same moral sincerity life arnold was born in laleham in the valley of the thames in eighteen twenty two his father was dr thomas arnold headmaster of rugby with whom many of us have grown familiar by reading tom brown's school days after fitting for the university at winchester and at rugby arnold entered balio college oxford where he was distinguished by winning prizes in poetry and by general excellence in the classics more than any other poet arnold reflects the spirit of his university the scholar gypsy and thyrsus contain many references to oxford and the surrounding country but they are more noticeable for their spirit of aloofness as if oxford men were too much occupied with classic dreams and ideals to concern themselves with the practical affairs of life after leaving the university arnold first taught the classics at rugby then in eighteen forty seven he became private secretary to lord lansdowne who appointed the young poet to the position of inspector of schools under the government in this position arnold worked patiently for the next thirty-five years traveling about the country examining teachers and correcting endless examination papers for ten years eighteen fifty seven eighteen sixty seven he was professor of poetry at oxford where his famous lectures on translating homer were given he made numerous reports on english and foreign schools and was three times sent abroad to study educational methods on the continent from this it will be seen that arnold led a busy often a laborious life and we can appreciate his statement that all his best literary work was done late at night after a day of drudgery it is well to remember that while carlyle was preaching about labor arnold labored daily that his work was cheerfully and patiently done and that after the day's work he hurried away like lamb to the elysian fields of literature he was happily married loved his home and especially loved children was free from all bitterness and envy and notwithstanding his cold manner was at heart sincere generous and true we shall appreciate his work better if we can see the man himself behind all that he has written 
arnold's literary work divides itself into three periods which we may call the poetical the critical and the practical he had written poetry since his school days and his first volume the strayed reveller and other poems appeared anonymously in eighteen forty nine three years later he published empedocles on etna and other poems but only a few copies of these volumes were sold and presently both were withdrawn from circulation in eighteen fifty three eighteen fifty five he published his signed poems and twelve years later appeared his last volume of poetry compared with the early work of tennyson these works met with little favor and arnold practically abandoned poetry in favor of critical writing the chief works of his critical period are the lectures on translating homer eighteen sixty one and the two volumes of essays in criticism eighteen sixty five eighteen eighty eight which made arnold one of the best-known literary men in england then like ruskin he turned to practical questions and his friendship's garland eighteen seventy one was intended to satirize and perhaps reform the great middle class of england whom he called the philistines culture and anarchy the most characteristic work of his practical period appeared in eighteen sixty nine these were followed by four books on religious subjects st paul and protestantism eighteen seventy literature and dogma eighteen seventy three god and the bible eighteen seventy five and last essays on church and religion eighteen seventy seven the discourses in america eighteen eighty five completes the list of his important works at the height of his fame and influence he died suddenly in eighteen eighty eight and was buried in the churchyard at laleham the spirit of his whole life is well expressed in a few lines of one of his own early sonnets one lesson nature let me learn of thee one lesson which in every wind is blown one lesson of two duties kept at one though the loud world proclaim their enmity of toil unsevered from tranquillity of labor that in lasting fruit outgrows far noisier schemes accomplished in repose too great for haste too high for rivalry his poetry works of matthew arnold we shall better appreciate arnold's poetry if we remember two things first he had been taught in his home a simple and devout faith in revealed religion and in college he was thrown into a world of doubt and questioning he faced these doubts honestly reverently in his heart longing to accept the faith of his fathers but in his head demanding proof and scientific exactness the same struggle between head and heart between reason and intuition goes on to-day and that is one reason why arnold's poetry which wavers on the borderland between doubt and faith is a favorite with many readers second arnold as shown in his essay on the study of poetry regarded poetry as a criticism of life under the conditions fixed for such criticism by the laws of poetic truth and poetic beauty naturally one who regards poetry as a criticism will write very differently from one who regards poetry as the natural language of the soul he will write for the head rather than for the heart and will be cold and critical rather than enthusiastic according to arnold each poem should be a unit and he protested against the tendency of english poets to use brilliant phrases and figures of speech which only detract attention from the poem as a whole for his models he went to greek poetry which he regarded as the only sure guidance to what is sound and true in poetical art arnold is however more indebted than he thinks to english masters especially to wordsworth and milton whose influence is noticeable in a large part of his poetry of arnold's narrative poems the two best known are balder dead eighteen fifty five an incursion into the field of norse mythology which is suggestive of gray 
and sorab and rustum 1853 which takes us into the field of legendary persian history the theme of the latter poem is taken from the shah nama book of kings of the persian poet firdausi who lived and wrote in the eleventh century sorab and rustum briefly the story is one of rustem or rustum a persian achilles who fell asleep one day when he had grown weary of hunting while he slept a band of robbers stole his favorite horse ruksh in trailing the robbers rustum came to the palace of the king of samangan where he was royally welcomed and where he fell in love with the king's daughter temine and married her but he was of a roving adventurous disposition and soon went back to fight among his own people the persians while he was gone his son sorab was born grew to manhood and became the hero of the turan army war arose between the two peoples and two hostile armies were encamped by the oxus each army chose a champion and rustum and sorab found themselves matched in mortal combat between the lines at this point sorab whose chief interest in life was to find his father demanded to know if his enemy were not rustum but the latter was disguised and denied his identity on the first day of the fight rustum was overcome but his life was spared by a trick and by the generosity of sorab on the second day rustum prevailed and mortally wounded his antagonist then he recognized his own son by a gold bracelet which he had long ago given to his wife temine the two armies rushing into battle were stopped by the sight of father and son weeping in each other's arms sorab died the war ceased and rustum went home to a life of sorrow and remorse using this interesting material arnold produced a poem which has the rare and difficult combination of classic reserve and romantic feeling it is written in blank verse and one has only to read the first few lines to see that the poet is not a master of his instrument the lines are seldom harmonious and we must frequently change the accent of common words or lay stress on unimportant particles to show the rhythm arnold frequently copies milton especially in his repetition of ideas and phrases but the poem as a whole is lacking in milton's wonderful melody the classic influence on sorab and rustum is especially noticeable in arnold's use of materials fights are short grief is long therefore the poet gives few lines to the combat but lingers over the son's joy at finding his father and the father's quenchless sorrow at the death of his son the last lines especially with their passionate grief set to solemn music makes this poem one of the best on the whole that arnold has written and the exquisite ending where the oxus unmindful of the trivial strifes of men flows on sedately to join his luminous home of waters is most suggestive of the poet's conception of the orderly life of nature in contrast with the doubt and restlessness of human life miscellaneous poems next in importance to the narrative poems are the elegies thyrsus the scholar gypsy memorial verses a southern night obermann stanzas from the grand chartreuse and rugby chapel all these are worthy of careful reading but the best is thyrsus a lament for the poet Clough which is sometimes classed with milton's lycidas and shelley's adonais among the minor poems the reader will find the best expression of arnold's ideals and methods in dover beach the love lyrics entitled switzerland requiescat shakespeare the future kensington gardens philomela human life calicles song morality and geist's grave 
the last being an exquisite tribute to a little dog which like all his kind had repaid our scant crumbs of affection with a whole life's devotion essays in criticism the first place among arnold's prose works must be given to the essays in criticism which raised the author to the front rank of living critics his fundamental idea of criticism appeals to us strongly the business of criticism he says is neither to find fault nor to display the critic's own learning or influence it is to know the best which has been thought and said in the world and by using this knowledge to create a current of fresh and free thought if a choice must be made among these essays which are all worthy of study we would suggest the study of poetry wordsworth byron and emerson the last named essay which is found in the discourses in america is hardly a satisfactory estimate of emerson but its singular charm of manner and its atmosphere of intellectual culture make it perhaps the most characteristic of arnold's prose writings among the works of arnold's practical period there are two which may be taken as typical of all the rest literature and dogma eighteen seventy three is in general a plea for liberality in religion arnold would have us read the bible for instance as we would read any other great work and apply to it the ordinary standards of literary criticism culture and anarchy culture and anarchy eighteen sixty nine contains most of the terms culture sweetness and light barbarian philistine hebraism and many others which are now associated with arnold's work and influence the term barbarian refers to the aristocratic classes whom arnold thought to be essentially crude in soul notwithstanding their good clothes and superficial graces philistine refers to the middle classes narrow-minded and self-satisfied people according to arnold whom he satirizes with the idea of opening their minds to new ideas hebraism is arnold's term for moral education carlyle had emphasized the hebraic or moral element in life and arnold undertook to preach the hellenic or intellectual element which welcomes new ideas and delights in the arts that reflect the beauty of the world the uppermost idea with hellenism he says is to see things as they are the uppermost idea with hebraism is conduct and obedience with great clearness sometimes with great force and always with a play of humor and raillery aimed at the philistines arnold pleads for both these elements in life which together aim at culture that is at moral and intellectual perfection general characteristics arnold's influence in our literature may be summed up in a word as intellectual rather than inspirational one cannot be enthusiastic over his poetry for the simple reason that he himself lacked enthusiasm he is however a true reflection of a very real mood of the past century the mood of doubt and sorrow and a future generation may give him a higher place than he now holds as a poet though marked by the elemental note of sadness all arnold's poems are distinguished by clearness simplicity and the restrained emotion of his classic models as a prose writer the cold intellectual quality which mars his poetry by restraining romantic feeling is of first importance since it leads him to approach literature with an open mind and with the single desire to find the best which has been thought and said in the world we cannot yet speak with confidence of his rank in literature but by his crystal clear style his scientific spirit of inquiry and comparison illumined here and there by the play of humor and especially by his broad sympathy and intellectual culture he seems destined to occupy a very high place among the masters of literary criticism End of section sixty two
section sixty three of english literature by william j long this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven continued john henry newman eighteen o one eighteen ninety any record of the prose literature of the victorian era which includes the historical essays of macaulay and the art criticism of ruskin should contain also some notice of its spiritual leaders for there was never a time when the religious ideals that inspire the race were kept more constantly before men's minds through the medium of literature among the religious writers of the age the first place belongs unquestionably to cardinal newman whether we consider him as a man with his powerful yet gracious personality or as a religious reformer who did much to break down old religious prejudices by showing the underlying beauty and consistency of the roman church or as a prose writer whose style is as near perfection as we have ever reached newman is one of the most interesting figures of the whole nineteenth century life three things stand out clearly in newman's life first his unshaken faith in the divine companionship and guidance second his desire to find and to teach the truth of revealed religion third his quest of an authoritative standard of faith which should remain steadfast through the changing centuries and amid all sorts and conditions of men the first led to that rare and beautiful spiritual quality which shines in all his work the second to his frequent doctrinal and controversial essays the third to his conversion to the catholic church which he served as priest and teacher for the last forty-five years of his life perhaps we should add one more characteristic the practical bent of his religion for he was never so busy with study or controversy that he neglected to give a large part of his time to gentle ministration among the poor and needy he was born in london in eighteen o one his father was an english banker his mother a member of a french huguenot family was a thoughtful devout woman who brought up her son in a way which suggests the mother of ruskin of his early training his reading of doctrinal and argumentative works and of his isolation from material things in the thought that there were two and only two absolute and luminously self-evident beings in the world himself and his creator it is better to read his own record in the apologia which is a kind of spiritual biography at the age of fifteen newman had begun his profound study of theological subjects for science literature art nature all the broad interests which attracted other literary men of his age he cared little his mind being wholly occupied with the history and doctrines of the christian church to which he had already devoted his life he was educated first at the school in ealing then at oxford taking his degree in the latter place in eighteen twenty though his college career was not more brilliant than that of many unknown men his unusual ability was recognized and he was made a fellow of oriel college retaining the fellowship and leading a scholarly life for over twenty years in eighteen twenty four he was ordained in the anglican church and four years later was chosen vicar of st mary's at oxford where his sermons made a deep impression on the cultivated audiences that gathered from far and near to hear him a change is noticeable in newman's life after his trip to the mediterranean in eighteen thirty two he had begun his life as a calvinist but while in oxford then the centre of religious unrest he described himself as drifting in the direction of liberalism then study and bereavement and an innate mysticism led him to a profound sympathy with the medieval church he had from the beginning opposed catholicism but during his visit to italy where he saw the roman church at the centre of its power and splendour many of his prejudices were overcome 
in this enlargement of his spiritual horizon newman was greatly influenced by his friend hurrell froude with whom he made the first part of the journey his poems of this period afterwards collected in the lyra apostolica among which is the famous lead kindly light are noticeable for their radiant spirituality but one who reads them carefully sees the beginning of that mental struggle which ended in his leaving the church in which he was born thus he writes of the catholic church whose services he had attended as one who in a foreign land receives the gifts of a good samaritan oh that thy creed were sound for thou dost soothe the heart thou church of rome by thy unwearied watch and varied round of service in thy saviour's holy home i cannot walk the city's sultry streets but the wide porch invites to still retreats where passion's thirst is calmed and care's unthankful gloom on his return to england in eighteen thirty three he entered into the religious struggle known as the oxford or tractarian movement note the oxford movement in religion has many points of resemblance to the pre-raphaelite movement in art both protested against the materialism of the age and both went back for their models to the middle ages originally the movement was intended to bring new life to the anglican church by a revival of the doctrine and practices of an earlier period recognizing the power of the press the leaders chose literature for their instrument of reform and by their tracts for the times they became known as tractarians to oppose liberalism and to restore the doctrine and authority of the early church was the center of their teaching their belief might be summed up in one great article of the creed with all that it implies i believe in one catholic and apostolic church the movement began at oxford with keble's famous sermon on national apostasy in eighteen thirty three but newman was the real leader of the movement which practically ended when he entered the catholic church in eighteen forty five end of note and speedily became its acknowledged leader those who wished to follow this attempt at religious reform which profoundly affected the life of the whole english church will find it recorded in the tracts for the times twenty-nine of which were written by newman and in his parochial and plain sermons eighteen thirty seven eighteen forty three after nine years of spiritual conflict newman retired to littlemore where with a few followers he led a life of almost monastic seclusion still striving to reconcile his changing belief with the doctrines of his own church two years later he resigned his charge at st mary's and left the anglican communion not bitterly but with a deep and tender regret his last sermon at littlemore on the parting of friends still moves us profoundly like the cry of a prophet torn by personal anguish in the face of duty in eighteen forty five he was received into the catholic church and the following year at rome he joined the community of st philip neri the saint of gentleness and kindness as newman describes him and was ordained to the roman priesthood by his preaching and writing newman had exercised a strong influence over his cultivated english hearers and the effect of his conversion was tremendous into the theological controversy of the next twenty years we have no mind to enter through it all newman retained his serenity and though a master of irony and satire kept his literary power always subordinate to his chief aim which was to establish the truth as he saw it whether or not we agree with his conclusions we must all admire the spirit of the man which is above praise or criticism his most widely read work apologia pro vita sua eighteen sixty four was written in answer to an unfortunate attack by charles kingsley which would long since have been forgotten had it not led to this remarkable book in eighteen fifty four newman was appointed rector of the catholic university in dublin 
but after four years returned to england and founded a catholic school at edgbaston in eighteen seventy nine he was made cardinal by pope leo the thirteenth the grace and dignity of his life quite as much as the sincerity of his apologia had long since disarmed criticism and at his death in eighteen ninety the thought of all england might well be expressed by his own lines in the dream of gerontius i had a dream yes some one softly said he's gone and then a sigh went round the room and then i surely heard a priestly voice cry subvenite and they knelt in prayer apologia pro vita sua works of newman readers approach newman from so many different motives some for doctrine some for argument some for a pure prose style that it is difficult to recommend the best works for the beginner's use as an expression of newman's spiritual struggle the apologia pro vita sua is perhaps the most significant this book is not light reading and one who opens it should understand clearly the reasons for which it was written newman had been accused of insincerity not only by kingsley but by many other men in the public press his retirement to solitude and meditation at littlemore had been outrageously misunderstood and it was openly charged that his conversion was a cunningly devised plot to win a large number of his followers to the catholic church this charge involved others and it was to defend them as well as to vindicate himself that newman wrote the apologia the perfect sincerity with which he traced his religious history showing that his conversion was only the final step in a course he had been following since boyhood silenced his critics and revolutionized public opinion concerning himself and the church which he had joined as the revelation of a soul's history and as a model of pure simple unaffected english this book entirely apart from its doctrinal teaching deserves a high place in our prose literature callista in newman's doctrinal works the via media the grammar of assent and in numerous controversial essays the student of literature will have little interest much more significant are his sermons the unconscious reflection of a rare spiritual nature of which professor sherp said his power shows itself clearly in the new and unlooked-for way in which he touched into life old truths moral or spiritual and as he spoke how the old truth became new and how it came home with a meaning never felt before he laid his finger how gently yet how powerfully on some inner place in the hearer's heart and told him things about himself he had never known till then subtlest truths which would have taken philosophers pages of circumlocution and big words to state were dropped out by the way in a sentence or two of the most transparent saxon of greater interest to the general reader are the idea of a university discourses delivered at dublin and his two works of fiction loss and gain treating of a man's conversion to catholicism and callista which is in his own words an attempt to express the feelings and mutual relations of christians and heathens in the middle of the third century the latter is in our judgment the most readable and interesting of newman's works the character of callista a beautiful greek sculptor of idols is powerfully delineated the style is clear and transparent as air and the story of the heroine's conversion and death makes one of the most fascinating chapters in fiction though it is not the story so much as the author's unconscious revelation of himself that charms us it would be well to read this novel in connection with kingsley's hypatia which attempts to reconstruct the life and ideals of the same period poems 
newman's poems are not so well known as his prose but the reader who examines the lira apostolica and verses on various occasions will find many short poems that stir a religious nature profoundly by their pure and lofty imagination and future generations may pronounce one of these poems the dream of gerontius to be newman's most enduring work this poem aims to reproduce the thoughts and feelings of a man whose soul is just quitting the body and who is just beginning a new and greater life both in style and in thought the dream is a powerful and original poem and is worthy of attention not only for itself but as a modern critic suggests as a revelation of that high spiritual purpose which animated newman's life from beginning to end newman's style of newman's style it is as difficult to write as it would be to describe the dress of a gentleman we had met who was so perfectly dressed that we paid no attention to his clothes his style is called transparent because at first we are not conscious of his manner and unobtrusive because we never think of newman himself but only of the subject he is discussing he is like the best french prose writers in expressing his thought with such naturalness and apparent ease that without thinking of style we receive exactly the impression which he means to convey in his sermons and essays he is wonderfully simple and direct in his controversial writings gently ironical and satiric and the satire is pervaded by a delicate humor but when his feelings are aroused he speaks with poetic images and symbols and his eloquence is like that of the old testament prophets like ruskin's his style is modeled largely on that of the bible but not even ruskin equals him in the poetic beauty and melody of his sentences on the whole he comes nearer than any other of his age to our ideal of a perfect prose writer critical writers other essayists of the victorian age we have selected the above five essayists macaulay carlyle arnold newman and ruskin as representative writers of the victorian age but there are many others who well repay our study notable among these are john addington simmons author of the renaissance in italy undoubtedly his greatest work and of many critical essays walter pater whose appreciations and numerous other works mark him as one of our best literary critics and leslie stephen famous for his work on the monumental dictionary of national biography and for his hours in a library a series of impartial and excellent criticisms brightened by the play of an original and delightful humor the scientists among the most famous writers of the age are the scientists lyell darwin huxley spencer tyndall and wallace a wonderful group of men whose works though they hardly belong to our present study have exercised an incalculable influence on our life and literature darwin's origin of species eighteen fifty nine which apparently established the theory of evolution was an epoch-making book it revolutionized not only our conceptions of natural history but also our methods of thinking on all the problems of human society those who would read a summary of the greatest scientific discovery of the age will find it in wallace's darwinism a most interesting book written by the man who claims with darwin the honor of first announcing the principle of evolution and from a multitude of scientific works we recommend also to the general reader huxley's autobiography and his lay sermons addresses and reviews partly because they are excellent expressions of the spirit and methods of science and partly because huxley as a writer is perhaps the clearest and the most readable of the scientists the spirit of modern literature as we reflect on the varied work of the victorian writers three marked characteristics invite our attention first our great literary men no less than our great scientists have made truth the supreme object of human endeavor all these eager poets novelists and essayists questing over so many different ways are equally intent on discovering the truth of life 
men as far apart as darwin and newman are strangely alike in spirit one seeking truth in the natural the other in the spiritual history of the race second literature has become the mirror of truth and the first requirement of every serious novel or essay is to be true to the life or the facts which it represents third literature has become animated by a definite moral purpose it is not enough for the victorian writers to create or attempt an artistic work for its own sake the work must have a definite lesson for humanity the poets are not only singers but leaders they hold up an ideal and they compel men to recognize and follow it the novelists tell a story which pictures human life and at the same time call us to the work of social reform or drive home a moral lesson the essayists are nearly all prophets or teachers and use literature as the chief instrument of progress and education among them all we find comparatively little of the exuberant fancy the romantic ardor and the boyish gladness of the elizabethans they write books not primarily to delight the artistic sense but to give bread to the hungry and water to the thirsty in soul milton's famous sentence a good book is the precious life-blood of a master spirit might be written across the whole victorian era we are still too near these writers to judge how far their work suffers artistically from their practical purpose but this much is certain that whether or not they created immortal works their books have made the present world a better and a happier place to live in and that is perhaps the best that can be said of the work of any artist or artisan summary of the victorian age the year eighteen thirty is generally placed at the beginning of this period but its limits are very indefinite in general we may think of it as covering the reign of victoria eighteen thirty seven nineteen o one historically the age is remarkable for the growth of democracy following the reform bill of eighteen thirty two for the spread of education among all classes for the rapid development of the arts and sciences for important mechanical inventions and for the enormous extension of the bounds of human knowledge by the discoveries of science at the accession of victoria the romantic movement had spent its force wordsworth had written his best work the other romantic poets coleridge shelley keats and byron had passed away and for a time no new development was apparent in english poetry though the victorian age produced two great poets tennyson and browning the age as a whole is remarkable for the variety and excellence of its prose a study of all the great writers of the period reveals four general characteristics one literature in this age has come very close to daily life reflecting its practical problems and interests and is a powerful instrument of human progress two the tendency of literature is strongly ethical all the great poets novelists and essayists of the age are moral teachers three science in this age exercises an incalculable influence on the one hand it emphasizes truth as the sole object of human endeavor it has established the principle of law throughout the universe and it has given us an entirely new view of life as summed up in the word evolution that is the principle of growth or development from simple to complex forms on the other hand its first effect seems to be to discourage works of the imagination though the age produced an incredible number of books very few of them belong among the great creative works of literature for though the age is generally characterized as practical and materialistic it is significant that nearly all the writers whom the nation delights to honor vigorously attack materialism and exalt a purely ideal conception of life on the whole we are inclined to call this an idealistic age fundamentally since love truth justice brotherhood all great ideals are emphasized as the chief ends of life not only by its poets but also by its novelists and essayists in our study we have considered one the poets the life and works of tennyson and browning and the chief characteristics of the minor poets elizabeth barrett mrs browning 
rossetti morris and swinburne two the novelists the life and works of dickens thackeray and george eliot and the chief works of charles reed anthony trollope charlotte bronte bulwer lytton kingsley mrs gaskell blackmore george meredith hardy and stevenson three the essayists the life and works of macaulay matthew arnold carlyle newman and ruskin these were selected from among many essayists and miscellaneous writers as most typical of the victorian age the great scientists like lyell darwin huxley wallace tyndall and spencer hardly belong to our study of literature though their works are of vast importance and we omit the works of living writers who belong to the present rather than to the past century suggestive questions note the best questions are those which are based upon the books essays and poems read by the pupil as the works chosen for special study vary greatly with different teachers and classes we insert here only a few questions of general interest one what are the chief characteristics of victorian literature name the chief writers of the period in prose and poetry what books of this period are in your judgment worthy to be placed among the great works of literature what effect did the discoveries of science have upon the literature of the age what poet reflects the new conception of law and evolution what historical conditions account for the fact that most of the victorian writers are ethical teachers two tennyson give a brief sketch of tennyson's life and name his chief works why is he like chaucer a national poet is your pleasure in reading tennyson due chiefly to the thought or the melody of expression note this figure in the lotus eaters music that gentler on the spirit lies than tired eyelids upon tired eyes what does this suggest concerning tennyson's figures of speech in general compare locksley hall with locksley hall sixty years after what differences do you find in thought in workmanship and in poetic enthusiasm what is tennyson's idea of faith and immortality as expressed in in memoriam three browning in what respects is browning like shakespeare what is meant by the optimism of his poetry can you explain why many thoughtful persons prefer him to tennyson what is browning's creed as expressed in rabbi ben ezra read fra lippo lippi or andrea del sarto and tell what is meant by a dramatic monologue in andrea what is meant by the lines ah but a man's reach should exceed his grasp or what's a heaven for four dickens what experiences in dickens life are reflected in his novels what are his favorite types of character what is meant by the exaggeration of dickens what was the serious purpose of his novels make a brief analysis of the tale of two cities having in mind the plot the characters and the style as compared with dickens other novels five thackeray read henry esmond and explain thackeray's realism what is there remarkable in the style of this novel compare it with ivanhoe as a historical novel what is the general character of thackeray's satire what are the chief characteristics of his novels describe briefly the works which show his great skill as a critical writer six george eliot read silas marner and make a brief analysis having in mind the plot the characters the style and the ethical teaching of the novel is the moral teaching of george eliot convincing that is does it suggest itself from the story or is it added for effect what is the general impression left by her books how do her characters compare with those of dickens and thackeray seven carlyle why is carlyle called a prophet and why a censor read the essay on burns and make an analysis having in mind the style the idea of criticism and the picture which this essay presents of the scotch poet is carlyle chiefly interested in burns or in his poetry 
does he show any marked appreciation of burns power as a lyric poet what is carlyle's idea of history as shown in heroes and hero worship what experiences of his own life are reflected in sartor resartus what was carlyle's message to his age what is meant by a carlylese style eight macaulay in what respects is macaulay typical of his age compare his view of life with that of carlyle read one of the essays on milton or addison and make an analysis having in mind the style the interest and the accuracy of the essay what useful purpose does macaulay's historical knowledge serve in writing his literary essays what is the general character of macaulay's history of england read a chapter from macaulay's history another from carlyle's french revolution and compare the two how does each writer regard history and historical writing what differences do you note in their methods what are the best qualities of each work why are both unreliable nine arnold what elements of victorian life are reflected in arnold's poetry how do you account for the coldness and sadness of his verses read sorab and rustum and write an account of it having in mind the story arnold's use of his material the style and the classic elements in the poem how does it compare in melody with the blank verse of milton or tennyson what marked contrasts do you find between the poetry and the prose of arnold ten ruskin in what respects is ruskin the prophet of modern society read the first two lectures in sesame and lilies and then give ruskin's view of labor wealth books education woman's sphere and human society how does he regard the commercialism of his age what elements of style do you find in these lectures give the chief resemblances and differences between carlyle and ruskin eleven read mrs gaskell's cranford and describe it having in mind the style the interest and the characters of the story how does it compare as a picture of country life with george eliot's novels twelve read blackmore's lorna doon and describe it as in the question above what are the romantic elements in the story how does it compare with scott's romances in style in plot in interest and in truthfulness to life chronology nineteenth century history eighteen thirty william the fourth eighteen thirty two reform bill eighteen thirty seven victoria death nineteen o one eighteen forty four morse's telegraph eighteen forty six repeal of corn laws eighteen fifty four crimean war eighteen fifty seven indian mutiny eighteen sixty seven dominion of canada established eighteen seventy government schools established eighteen eighty gladstone prime minister eighteen eighty seven queen's jubilee nineteen o one edward the seventh literature eighteen twenty five macaulay's essay on milton eighteen twenty six mrs browning's early poems eighteen thirty tennyson's poems chiefly lyrical eighteen thirty three browning's pauline eighteen thirty three eighteen thirty four carlyle's sartor resartus eighteen thirty six eighteen sixty five dickens novels eighteen thirty seven carlyle's french revolution eighteen forty three macaulay's essays eighteen forty three eighteen sixty ruskin's modern painters eighteen forty seven eighteen fifty nine thackeray's important novels eighteen forty seven eighteen fifty seven charlotte bronte's novels eighteen forty eight eighteen sixty one macaulay's history eighteen fifty three kingsley's hypatia mrs gaskell's cranford eighteen fifty three eighteen fifty five matthew arnold's poems eighteen fifty six mrs browning's aurora lee eighteen fifty eight eighteen seventy six george eliot's novels eighteen fifty nine eighteen eighty eight tennyson's idols of the king eighteen fifty nine darwin's origin of species 
1864 newman's apologia tennyson's enoch arden 1865-1888 arnold's essays in criticism 1868 browning's ring and the book 1869 blackmore's lorna dune 1879 meredith's the egoist 1883 stevenson's treasure island 1885 ruskin's praeterita begun 1889 browning's last work asolando 1892 death of tennyson end of section 63 end of chapter 11 end of english literature its history and its significance for the life of the english-speaking world by william j long recorded by tony oliva october seventeenth twenty thirteen